Who makes the Nazis? Well, no prizes for guessing what we'll be talking about today. Absolutely breathtaking scenes in Washington, D.C. yesterday. Um, uh, terrifying, of course, because of gun laws in America, but also grimly predictable and, of course, predicted. <sighs> I, I, I would remind you at this point in proceedings that I only have to put £10 in the tin when I say I told you so in the context of Brexit. I've made no such pledge in the context of Donald Trump, and indeed if I had, I'd now be facing bankruptcy, or at least I'd be running the risk of bankruptcy. But the idea that anybody could have been surprised by what this man has unleashed is, to my mind, deeply disingenuous. It, it, it's been obvious from the start that his flirtations with fascism would be consummated at the very first first opportunity and of course the first opportunity comes when he is no longer the elected president of America but is somehow determined to cling on to office and to power that is how the playbook unfolds at almost every comparable point in history um, and the question of how it happened is perhaps not as complicated as it initially appears you, you know I, I am going to ask you how you account for the culmination last night, how, how you account for each step upon the path to where America has ended up. But I don't know that there is much debate about where it began. It began with birtherism. It, it began with Donald Trump's decision to lie through his teeth about Barack Obama's birth. And it worked as a rhetorical device and a political um, uh, tactic because of racism, because of white, white supremacism or just base bigotry, however you prefer to term it. The idea that a man of colour could be president of the United States of America struck some people so deeply that they were prepared to hold their nose, close their eyes and go along with what were obvious lies. Uh, to, to qualify, there were some people, no doubt, who genuinely believed that there were question marks hanging over Barack Obama's birth, but you had to desire to believe it in order to get to the point where you believed it. You had to want it to be true, and if you wanted it to be true, it was because you saw his skin colour as somehow delegitimizing his humanity and his right to be President of the United States of America. So when you start tracing back to its very origins, the uncorked fascism that was on the streets of America yesterday, you, I think, begin with the birtherism. You begin with the claim that this American is not an American because he's black. It really is, to me, as simple as that. As ever, when I think things are simple, the next thing I do is invite you to ring me and tell me why I'm wrong. 0345 6060 is, as ever, the number that you need. So the horrible bit now is, of course, the complicity in this, uh, uh, well, this goose stepping towards what we saw last night. The complicity in it is something that almost everybody in the British media is guilty of. Whether it's Michael Gove uh, <laughs> interviewing Donald Trump without telling anyone that Rupert Murdoch was in the same room. This is all after the birtherism, remember? The birtherism was the point at which civilised society should have shut the door on Donald Trump, locked it and thrown away the key. If he was allowed to get away with that, for my money, and again, call me, put me straight, for my money... That, that was the breaking point, bizarrely, long before he even announced his intention to run for president. The damage had been done, that the genie was out of the bottle, because that level of obvious, base, unapologetic racism, this man has no right to be president, he has no right to be American, because he's black, is the seed from which all that followed did grow. I really do believe that, by the way. I, I, I'm not being facetious when I say give me a call and tell me why I'm wrong, but I, I am being completely sincere with you when I, when I say that the birtherism is the... Well, the birtherism is, is the, the source of all the evil that followed. 
And then you start looking at some of the other milestones on this path, on this march, and you think of maybe the Access Hollywood tape, which had nothing to do with racism and everything to do with uh, another bigotry, the basest misogyny that you could imagine. People in this country and in our media and our political establishment queuing up to excuse his self-confessed sexual depravity as locker room talk. You remember? I don't even need to say the names, do I? I I'll try perhaps to focus upon people who are in public life, in politics, in this country rather than in the media, but I may struggle to sustain that uh, ambition. So Gove goes there. The front page of the Sun has Trump, I back Boris. Everywhere you turn, Jacob Rees-Mogg writing articles for the Telegraph about why a Trump victory would be great for uh, the UK. Uh, Andrew Neil Spectator magazine, practically a fanzine for Donald Trump at times, and uh, publishing some of the most toxic and the most dishonest journalism that I have ever encountered in my life. But, hey-ho, they'll still be back at work today. They'll be back on air tomorrow. Uh, Well-known television host who blocked me on Twitter last night after we had something of a bromance last year because he was probably the most prominent British cheerleader for Donald Trump long after the birtherism. So, look, 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing, right? And it may well be that you were aware of Trump's depravity long before the rest of us were, or that you actually thought that the uh, aspersions cast upon Barack Obama's birth were not as profound and as uh, important as I now see them to be. But if you try to get a bead on how the hell this happened, you have to begin with the legitimizing of racism. You have to begin with all the people who complain about political correctness and who complain about wokeism and who complain about uh, those of us who pursue equality, sometimes with a slightly aggressive demeanor, because all they've ever really wanted, whether they realize it or not, is a return to the days when it was okay to be publicly and horribly racist. And Donald Trump, along with his British equivalents, arrived on the political stage with that irresistible invitation. Half of a country will bite your arm off if you invite them to be publicly and freely racist once again. What do you think complaints about political correctness and cancel culture and wokeism are really about? They're complaints about people saying don't be racist. They're complaints about people saying if you are racist in public you should probably get punished in some way, whether it involves losing your livelihood or whether it involves uh, some other sort of sanction. It is reasonable to suggest that trying to dehumanize another person is... <sighs> an offence that should be punished. But they call that political correctness. They call that wokeism. It's not. It's just anti-racism. And the men who came forward in Britain and America over the last few years with a very seductive invitation to be racist once again, to blame your entire life on somebody else, well, they all bear responsibility for what happened in America yesterday. All of them. So, how do you explain it? possibly through the lens that I've just offered you, the lens of casting aspersions upon Barack Obama's birth, because somewhere deep in the bile ducts of men like Donald Trump, the idea that a black man can be president of their country is absolutely intolerable. Or you may have a, a different starting point or a different explanation or a different analysis. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. And, um, of course... What do we do next? It might be too early to ask this question. What, what should happen publicly? The public sphere, the media, the fourth estate, the, 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 the organisations and individuals that are supposed to speak truth to power and hold governments to account. What happens to all the people that waved through Donald Trump? What happens to all the people who waved their little flags? What about that invitation that was made to the people of this city, London, not too long ago, to choose between the British mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, or the American president of America, Donald Trump? And how many people actually elected to side with the uncorked racist against the democratically elected mayor of London? These problems run deep. These problems run deep. And many of them have been created quite deliberately by people who are already trying to wash their hands of responsibility. I see you. I see you claiming it's all down to Donald Trump and nobody else. I see you signing the checks for people that have been cheerleading for him for years. I see you boasting about your friendship and now somehow claiming that it was all grimly predictable and we should have seen through him years ago. Well, here's the news, my dudes. We did. 
We saw through him years ago. We saw through him from day one. We knew exactly what he represented and exactly where it could lead. Unchallenged, base bigotry, legitimized racism, white supremacism passed off as both sides. We saw this. And I'm afraid that you don't get to wash your hands this time. Because what we saw in America yesterday was not something we should celebrate. It was a very, very narrow escape. It was an incredibly close call. It was the moment where those who've been encouraged to flirt with fascism since Donald Trump was elected sought to consummate that relationship and mount an actual coup. That's incredible. There's a tendency, if you do what I do for a living, to lean towards hyperbole. But that is truly incredible. Think back to 2015. Think back to the final year of Barack Obama's presidency. America is a hugely imperfect country. But my goodness me, how far and how fast it has fallen. And that is incredible. It is... It is bothering me slightly that I genuinely see it all as having its source in simple racism. It, it bothers me because I don't want racism to have that sort of power. I don't want racism to be that intoxicating, to be that uh, popular, I suppose, is the only word I, I, I use at this point. I don't want it to be. So in many ways, I, I don't want it to be that simple. But from where I sit, and I have watched events, as you will know, quite closely over the years, you could argue, in fact, that my first book explains exactly how what happened yesterday happened, and my second book explains why so many of the people in my profession responsible for uh, uh, green-lighting Donald Trump will never be able to admit that they were wrong. So I, I am a student of this stuff, and I can't help feeling a little embarrassed that I don't have a more complex analysis. But all Donald Trump ever offered people was the right to be publicly racist again. And if I live to be 212, I will always struggle to grasp just how popular that invitation proved and will perhaps always prove to be. I also want you to call me and talk to me today, just, just as we have done at points over our years together without a specific question. The morning after Barack Obama was elected, most obviously, was just a morning for a sort of shared... Uh, conversation. So feel free to do that. Tell me your feelings. How do you respond to what happened in America yesterday? But we will begin, because we must, with the question of how this happened. And you can either build upon, challenge, endorse or reject my suggestion that when Donald Trump was permitted to remain on the public stage after casting aspersions upon the circumstances of Barack Obama's birth, the die was cast. And yesterday, it stopped rolling. We can only thank our lucky stars that he came up with double one instead of double six. Because if things had gone differently on the streets of Washington DC yesterday, what do you think Donald Trump would be doing today? How did the United States of America fall so far so fast? Your answers to that question. David's in Earl's Court to kick things off. David, what do you reckon? Well, I, I, I'm completely unsurprised by the way that this has all gone down. In fact, yeah, I was so too. unsurprised last night, I didn't even watch it on TV. I just kind of followed it loosely on social media. Um, I grew up in New York, and um, you know, I've been aware of Donald Trump for decades, before, way before he got into politics. And it's, it's been clear that this is what, what he would wind up being like you know, f for decades now. There's a, a great story to illustrate this from... Um, Back in the 1980s, I think it was, there was a woman who was jogging in Central Park and was attacked and raped. Yes, and the, the Central Park Five. Up. Exactly. And then he, he took out a full-page ad in the New York Times saying that they should be put to death. And then decades later, after they spent time in prison, he, he, and they, they then found through DNA evidence that they hadn't actually committed the crime. He then insisted that they were still guilty and that they should be put to death. Can I ask so, you a question? This is a weird one. Yes. Do you think, as someone who's watched him for longer and more closely than, than, than most people listening to the program, when he lies like that, that, that's one example, but of course there are millions, do you think he knows he's lying? This is the thing I, I, I found myself when I first started covering Donald Trump. 
I found myself wondering whether he realises he's lying or whether there's something psychologically more complex going on and he somehow believes things that are demonstrably untrue. So you mentioned the DNA evidence. You mentioned it became incontrovertibly true that these five young men had not, five young black men for the avoidance of doubt, had not committed this crime and yet still he insisted that they had. Do you think he believed it at that point? I think his, I think, well, he's a malignant narcissist and I right. think... It's a, in his twisted mind, whatever he believes is the truth. Yes. So you know, when, when he comes out with these statements, I do think in his mind, somewhere deep down inside, he might know on some level, but I think if, you know, it, he's not capable of reconciling what his desires and wants are and what his needs are or his perceived needs are from the truth. So, he, he, so he, yeah. he, he takes a view on what he wants to be true and then just believes that it is. Moving yeah, forward. And, and, he, and he seizes upon any, any shred of potential evidence, signs, rumors that will support his beliefs and raises them to um, the level of, of things that you can, you can believe in. Culminating in him uh, standing on, on a podium and saying straight into a television camera, don't, don't believe what you see and what you hear, believe what I tell you, because that, yeah. of course, is what he has always done. Okay, so I, I, I value your sort of knowledge and history on Trump. How does it reach your ears when I, as a, as a relatively well-educated uh, cosmopolitan Brit, say I'm staggered that so many Americans didn't just go along with this, but actively embraced it? Well, that's the thing I think is really the interesting point. And I, I listen to you almost every day and have done oh, for I'm years sorry. now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, I often listen to various topics that you discuss, whether it be, has been ISIS, Brexit, um, you know, what's going on in the States with Donald Trump. Mm. And the thing that doesn't get brought up is the influence of social media on all this. Yes. Um, and also the influence, uh, influence of the fact that uh, Rupert Murdoch owns so much of the media around the world yes. um, and uses that to influence. I think, you know, it's the same process by which a kid here in the UK, you know, a Muslim kid who comes from a probably normal, moderate family, gets groomed into believing that he needs to go to Syria to fight for ISIS is the same force that's affecting Americans in the States who are being groomed online to believe that, um, you know, there is a, a secret democratic plot to run pedophile rings out of pizza parlor basements. It's, it's radicalization uh, in, in, in the, yes, in the exactly. purest sense People of the word. And the same thing with Brexit here. So I, I think until, you know, I've always been a big advocate of, of free speech, mm. but I, I think we need to find some way to manage social media. I don't, I don't know what can be done to, to break this cycle, because I think as long as that's going on... Well, it, brings, it leads us actually kind of to, to, to coronavirus. You, you can still publicly, yeah, and, and some people invite you onto their programmes to do so, talk undiluted twaddle, I mean science-free gibberish. Andrea Leadsom, I don't know why her name pops into my head as soon as I use the word gibberish, but she was on telly yesterday uh, <laughs> insisting that the chief medical officer uh, bring evidence for his decisions to her personally because she, she, she sort of needs to cast an eye over them. And that that's not... See, this is, I, I bridle slightly at the accusation that we don't talk about it enough. Some people listening will, will, will find that quite funny, but now's not the time for me to uh, preen and massage my own ego. Because the, the, the problem for me, perhaps, is social media has, has followed. Where's the dog and where's the tail? So when you get someone like, and I'm going to use Andrea Leadsom as an example because there was a big moment in my career where I, I, I found myself listening to her challenging the former director general of the WTO's understanding of the WTO. And I sat there thinking, how the hell has this been allowed to happen? How the hell have I ended up part of it? Is that a consequence of social media undermining objective truth? Or has social media followed where Brexit and Trump type politicians have led? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. What's your thought? Well, I think there has to be a kernel of this within people. Yes. There has to be some sort of feeling of resentment or fear or anything. You know, there's something deep down inside in these people that make them perhaps more susceptible than other people. I, I, I don't yeah. know. But I also think that, you know, inadvertently, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Mr. Dorsey at Twitter mm. have handed countries that are adversaries of our system of you know, democracy. You know, I, I don't want to mention names, but Putin, for example, we've handed them a massive megaphone to get yes. right into people's minds. So, uh, so, and where, so where once these people would have been cranks and, and therefore 
isolated, you know, that they would have been avoided often by their own family members or, or, or they would have been writing in green ink to, to newspapers. Social media has allowed them to coalesce and to, to kind of feed off each other and to build these movements because I think you, you make a brilliant point. You make several, actually, David. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect start to the programme. But, of course, yesterday couldn't have happened without social media. They, they couldn't have organised. They couldn't have uh, congregated like that. They couldn't have. They, would, they couldn't have uh, cooperated. It was presumably born of various racist Facebook groups, and and there is responsibility there with the platforms for for posting it. And also, had Donald Trump not been president of America, his Twitter account would have been closed down years ago. So, I, I, you know, lots of. Uh, Lots of places to point the finger, but it begins, I think, in terms of his presidency at least, with the birtherism. Obviously the racism, as David has reminded us and, and, and illuminated for us, goes way, way back. Uh, Terry's in Cobham. Terry, what do you think? Good morning, James. Nice to speak to you again. Well, Freud summed it up completely, Trump. Go on. Absolutely, with these three words. Pseudo-logistica fantastica. And that is somebody who actually says something that is a complete lie and has total belief in himself. Total belief. Unlike Boris Johnson, who knows when he's lying. That's the difference of the two. He's a pseudo logistica fantastic. And if you, so if we, you I want to put that you, to music, Terry. I want to set that to music. Well, no, it's, got, it's got a lovely ring to it. James, it's totally, it's totally true, and people will think even well, that can't be right. That's just uh, he's saying it wrong. But that's exactly what well, he I'm is. certainly not thinking that. I don't. Uh, be oh, a no, very erudite man, no, as we, we've established yeah. before. But that is it. So that's you. True. So this for me, I didn't know that this question it's would. A put, is it? Uh, he, he genuinely believes it then. So he says one, stuff. One, he... No, one, one, one billion percent. I had a friend who passed away about three years ago. I was his partner for 28 years. And he would phone me up and he would say something to me. And he wasn't lying. He totally believed what he said. He, yes. It was in business. Totally lying. Then I'd speak to the third party. And the third party, who, who was a, a, a straight, straight shooter, if you like, would turn around and say, I didn't say that. Never I didn't happened. Agree with that or and he was, that's how he was described. Pseudo logistica, fantastica. S totally believes it. Totally believes it. You couldn't convince him that he was lying. And that, so that, that's it. That is it. I didn't. I mean, that is. I'm mean, Freud. I, I didn't know. I, I'm not widely read on Freud. But that idea of it being in, an impenetrable conviction, an absolute certainty built on complete bilge seems to sum up an awful lot of what's happened on both sides of the Atlantic in the last five years. And that's the phrase that resonates most with me. In the last five years, it's taken half a decade to watch America collapse into the scenes that we saw in D.C. last night. How long it will take, God only knows, to, to, to rebuild that reputation. Terry, what a superb contribution. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If there is a radio phone in, in the world with better callers than mine, well, I'm yet to hear of it. Donald Trump is the result of a process. He is not the process. So it isn't just about birtherism. The question, if you're just joining us, predictably enough today, is how the hell did this happen to America? And I think that there are other elements that promoted him. So, for example, his obvious and toxic racism would not perhaps have got the footholds that it achieved were it not for the financial crisis uh, or for Islamist terrorism, which allowed uh, a stoking of, of broader xenophobias in the way that he talked about Muslims and then suddenly segued effortlessly into Mexicans or migrants in general. And, you know, terrorism is designed to terrorise us. So it, it, it creates fertile ground for, for that kind of demagoguery and, and racist verbal violence and course where racist verbal violence leads racist actual violence quickly follows but but other pivot points amazon particularly good form this morning i, I I'll, I'll read out some of her earlier messages later but but the latest one says sandy hook of course was a pivot point half of the right wing channel denizens are now claiming that these rioters are, are patriots the other half are confidently asserting that it's all an anti false flag operation it's it's true that actually believe it or not uh, and Alex Jones on Infowars helped break the system when he claimed all those dead children in Sandy Hook were dummies and their parents crisis actors. It's, it's absolutely true that, because Donald Trump regularly appeared on that guy's show. Um, and, and he was literally, there was a father of a murdered child on television this week in full disguise because he has to live 
in a, a, a form of secrecy. He has to live like he's on a witness protection program because followers of people like Alex Jones on Infowars have made his life hell. And, and his crime is to have had his child murdered in a school shooting. So, I, I mean, that's like symbiosis, isn't it? It's not parasitism, it's symbiosis, because they feed on each other. So, Trump must know somewhere that Sandy Hook was real, but the breach of truth, the undermining of objective truth, grows when people like Alex Jones are allowed to spout this vile nonsense, not just allowed to spout this vile nonsense, but applauded for it. And I think they're, they're British equivalents of Infowars. I think there's a fella who lives in his mum's basement who, who, who actually worked for Infowars and did similar kind of inflammatory nonsense. And, and you know, then you've got the very, very right-wing online faux news organisations like Breitbart. And, of course, in this country, you could work for Breitbart, but also work for Andrew Neil Spectator. So all of this legitimization goes on because it allows a sort of intellectualization, a pretense that this isn't just base, bog standard, disgusting racism. And that's what Donald Trump opened the door to. Whether or not people realize it's happening, I, I, I wouldn't like to say. I, I certainly wouldn't like to conclude that everybody who looked warmly at Donald Trump would sign up for the Ku Klux Klan in a, in a heartbeat. But you know, how else do you explain what happened yesterday? Emma, Emma goes on. I come back to the phrase crank magnetism over and over. Thinking in a certain fashion opens up the space for similar ideas to promulgate. If you're already of the view that the white race is a literal, separate and superior population, it's only a small step to volkism or the need to defend that separatism with guns or God or both. And it's that root race belief that... Um, uh, from which all else follows. Kevin's in Finchley. Kevin, what do you think? Hi, James. Hello, mate. Um, so, you know, I am horrified at the moment. Um, and let me tell you reasons why. I, I have two beautiful kids. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're black kids. No, so, you know, my, my wife is Indian, but, okay. you know, they're effectively black kids. And, you know, I was hoping for better for my kids. Now, when, when I say better, let me explain. In the 80s, I got chased by a bunch of skinheads, pathetic, inadequate little boys. Mm. I fell over on some glass um, and blood came out of my arm. They ran away. Yeah, they thought, right. oh, gosh. Which is, you know, so thank God um, I'm still here today. In the 90s, things seem to be getting a better, you know, um, you know pol yes. political correctness came into place. You know, and, you know, laws were put in place to stop people from being racist, from being horrific, from being, you know, inhuman. Um, and I think for about probably 10, 20 years, that seemed to work. And I, and I, I think 90s, early, you know, 20, you know the, the early noughties, probably the, the pinnacle of my existence on this earth, you know, regarding political, um, you, know, you know, systems, you know, you know racism, anti-racism, laws in place. You know, it seemed to be going well. Were, were you and a raver? Thought, okay, yeah, oh, God, yeah. Well, that's also part of it, Kevin. I don't think we should overlook the importance of that movement to your feelings of oneness with the universe. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, soul to soul, and back to life, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I get it. I hear it. But, you know, look, the thing is, I think what's happened, and you, and you get this all the time, that we saw this in Nazi Germany, when there is a, you know, you know when there's a challenge um, economically, um, people will always look for a scapegoat. And what's happened now is... You know, if I'm a middle-aged white gentleman who hasn't achieved very much in life, haven't you know, all my aspirations have gone, mm. and, but but I have whiteness, and I see a black guy down a road or Indian guy, whatever, Muslim guy doing better, mm. and I see all these you know systems in place to make sure that that other person can do well and can achieve as much as I can. By the way. I'm going to resent the hell out of that person. And if there's then a person telling me that, guess what? Yes, you are white and you are right. You, know, you do deserve you better. You deserve better, you know. Look who's holding you back. There's a black man in the White House. Oh, my God. I mean, that, that was it. I mean, literally, that, you know, that was it. That was... The, no, that was the beginning of the end. Now, we all were very happy with it. Not, not everyone, but we were no, happy about Obama. I was shocked. And that was the beginning of the end. And for me, what I'm going back to my children mm. is I believe that we are regressing. And I think, I I think we've that. only seen the start of something horrible. I think not only is there going to be a civil war in America, 
But we cannot pretend that it's lovely, you know, in you know, hunky dory over here. Look at when um, you know um, the Black Lives Matter, um, well, big Britain's Got Talent dance, and the Ofcom, and now the people complaining. Yes. When we had the Sainsbury's advert, happened to have a black family, and the father happened to be a decent, upstanding citizen. People were upset and saying, "Well, he should be a single father. He should have baby mothers." I mean, it was an absolute disgrace. There is such resentment and hatred that someone like me can actually achieve, can actually go, you know, do a good job, send my kids to school, and my kids will aspire to be better than just drug dealers. They, they actually resent that. And that's why they can't, you know, well, you're... No, it's, all, it's, it's why you hear complaints about white working class boys falling behind black boys, but never any complaints from, the, from those people about white working class boys falling behind white middle class boys. So they're perfectly comfortable with that, but they're not comfortable yeah. with the idea of children like yours doing, doing better. And that's not, a, I mean, that, that goes right up to the top of the profession that I'm currently in. You'll hear that kind of toxic rhetoric on an almost daily basis. Do you think Trump could have happened without Obama? No. No, nor do I. Um, no. I think Obama... God, that's depressing. Uh, ...was, you know, basically, you know, he, he was he was final now. He was almost, you know, and, you know, he, his book, you know, The Audacity of Hope, I'll yes. say I reread, you know, The Audacity of Trying to Be President. <laughs> yes. uh, that was too much for a lot of people who could not stand Sub to see. Subconsciously as well as consciously, I think. I think some people just felt a, 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 a sense of anger or injustice, but... If you had, I mean, still, if, if you'd pointed out that this was built upon racism, they get very, very cross with you, but they can't actually articulate where that burning sense of unfairness and injustice comes from. Well, you know, racism, you know, if I, if I fight racism, I'm race baiting. You know, if I just put also, you've got a chip, up, you've got a chip on your shoulder as well, oh, and you're playing yeah. the race card, remember? And here's a race hilarious card. meme that I've downloaded <laughs> off the internet that I'm going to stick on your Facebook page or whatever it may be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and yeah, and so, you know, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sat here and, you know, I think just, you know, I think you can view this from the sidelines and look at it. You know, mm. This is disgraceful. Yes, no, that's true. Go that's home true. today. Um, I, I, I can't. I, I do fear for my children and, and their future. Obviously. And that's white privilege, which again is a, is a phrase that's been horribly misused and abused over, over the last few years. But, but, but Kevin is quite right. I have literally no skin in this game. And although, you know, I might have a target painted on my back by, by really nasty racists in, in, in the British media and the British public, I, I don't have skin in the game and that's white privilege even if i was you know uh, sleeping on the streets as a white person i wouldn't have that particular worry that kevin describes so you might not have any other privileges at all but again words seem so important don't they language seems so important in understanding things and if if you have rage growing within you if you have rage burning within you if you have hatreds and bitterness and bigotries and you're not sure why and you reject the idea that it's that it's racist then you will sign up you will march alongside these people who, who legitimise your grievances and, and legitimise your bigotries and let you pretend that they're not built on prejudices. So, wow. I mean, caller after caller after caller. I've got a feeling we might drop mystery out today and stay with this for the whole three hours. It's going to depend entirely upon my... Uh my equilibrium, but, but right now, I think we're learning. I think we're assembling evidence, if you like, or explanation at least, of what happened yesterday. And those of us who, and I, I'm not going to apologise for saying I told you so, uh, you know, so, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the people who've come after me in the last few years for simply stating facts and telling the truth, I, <laughs> absolutely vindicated yesterday. All of us who, who used the word fascism to describe Donald Trump, all of us who were accused of Trump derangement syndrome, all of us who described calmly and honestly what he was unleashing and what he represented were vindicated on an incredible scale, an unexpected scale uh, last night, yesterday. So, yeah, I told you so. But I still don't fully understand it all. And that's the quest we will continue after these words. How, how did this happen? So, Donald Trump's presidency, which was always going to... Well, that's not true. He could have won. I, I, this is the astonishing reality, is, is that without the coronavirus, Donald Trump probably would have won a second term in America. So uh, on the morning where many people thought he had, uh, because the earliest results suggested a surprise victory for him, it, it, I think we did a show on, on 
a similar theme to this actually, which is the, and Kevin I think expressed this better than I ever could, is, is that horrible sense of recognition, of just knowing, yeah, what he offers is disgusting, but popular. In a way, that's, that's the definition of populism, isn't it? It's, it's something that's disgusting and, and largely untrue, but somehow popular. That's why you have two different words. Popular and populism mean different things. So that, that notion that they now know what he is, and they voted for him again. 70 million people voted for him again, but they know what he is. It, it, it's, it's not exactly uplifting, is it? And I do think that last night there was an incredibly narrow escape from something much, much worse. Uh, so would there have been Donald Trump without Barack Obama? No. Would Donald Trump have become president without unleashing and legitimizing the, the, the most ancient of hatreds? No, probably not. But the environment into which he moved already existed. So uh, a couple of you have pointed out, uh, one of you kind enough to mention that I do, I do know her and like her, Meghan McCain, but her dad, John McCain, he signed up Sarah Palin, didn't he, to be his running mate. And that kind of kick-started or, or, or turbocharged the so-called Tea Party movement, which was yet another euphemism for, for, for a massive racist organisation. This idea that you are legitimising what you had been told for 20 years was unacceptable, which is where Down With Political Correctness comes in. I might have to start plugging my first book, having spent most of the last few months plugging my, my second book, but this is all in How To Be Right. It's because, of course, I, I speak to people who've bought it, not the book, the, the, the lies, the toxicity, the prejudice, the bigotry, the hatred. I speak to people and unpick where it comes from. So whether I'm asking them about what they mean when they say political correctness or whether when they say all Muslims should apologise for terrorism or whether they're talking about Donald Trump and, and uh, trying to claim that they're not racist and as you just pull in each thread, that conviction falls apart. It, it, it is easy to plot, but what you can never do if you were like me, perhaps you, you, you're better at this. It's maybe a, a shortage of empathy or something on my part. I don't think I can ever fully understand the hunger, the desire to be deceived, the desperation to believe that the reason why you don't have all the things you would like to have is because of somebody over there who was born in a different country or was born with different colour skin from you. I, I don't know that any of us ever get our heads around that. And the big shock for me as you know, over the last few years, has been to see how deep it goes and, and how many of us fail to see it. 10.52 is the time. Susan's in Finsbury Park. Susan, how do you explain it? Right, okay. Uh, I don't think there will be a civil war in the United States no, because, it's been, because it's been going on since the Civil War. Okay. I also think Obama didn't bring on Trump. Trump's been on the verge for a long time. Okay. We, had, we had outrage when Kennedy wanted to become president, a Catholic president. We're all going to be governed by the Pope. But coming from a Protestant family, that's what they felt. Yes. They couldn't couldn't follow it, and they didn't vote for it, and they were Republican. And then we moved on to the civil rights. I heard from my brother and from my uh, nephews, their racism, it was there. It was loud in the house it was quiet elsewhere maybe yeah. not so quiet in some places it moves on we have the civil rights movement we go on we then start getting popular votes i can go to the pub i can go to the bar with uh, george bush and have a behind but i could never go with whoever dukakis or whoever was run, uh, running against him so it's been coming and coming obama was a surprise i think to many americans many americans voted for him not just uh black Americans, we heard something from him that we wanted to hear. And so we voted for him and that may have been the trigger. And then we'd get this, we get this populist president, we get a, uh, the ruined by George Bush. And uh, so, so we vote for somebody who is totally different. And I think that's what, I think that's what happened. Um, well, it's hard to argue with, 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 with that analysis, but, but it, 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 you did slightly contradict yourself because. Uh, okay. But, but no, I, I sound like a right old pain in the proverbials now. But but because <laughs> I think what you're saying is I, I don't think that Trump could have come 
to power at this point in American history if he hadn't been immediately preceded by Barack Obama. But I'm not suggesting for a minute that the, but the, the, the waves that washed him into the White House only came into existence with, with Barack Obama. It's, it's, it's a bigger picture than that that I'm trying to describe. I think the, I think, I think of uh, white America, the, the white Americans who voted for Trump were so disillusioned. They, they come from probably a very worse background and the people who destroy them i come from a town in indiana yes. that was the richest town in the united states all those companies miles laboratories a number of companies left the city it became the poorest the people were destroyed not by by um black people no. they were destroyed by white people but the then the white uh uh Right wing, right part. Well, I mean, that's what you do. You come and whisper in their ear that, that you know, don't, yeah. don't, don't blame the billionaire plutocrats who've moved production of their their company to to China or or, or to the yeah. Middle East. Blame blame the Mexicans over there, or blame the you, you know, I don't know who it is at the moment. Who's in the firing line at the moment? Most is it? I suppose it's it's, it's so called woke people. Is it? They're all to blame for the for the miseries that the that the bigots endure. I, I <laughs> what happens next then? Because. These people aren't going away. Sarah Palin's already been speaking about about forming a new party. About yes, well, let her. I, I just let her. I think Joe Biden has come across really well. He's not my candidate. No, but he's come across well in the past few weeks. The past few Continuous. hours, actually, his, his, he was very statesmanlike last night, wasn't he? And, and he was in the right place. He, he he came up. He stepped forward. He stepped up. Yeah. And that's what Americans have been used to. Other, you know, George Bush stepped up over to 11. Others have stepped up. What does Trump do? He does a tweet. And I think... Yeah. Um, even I think now, he, even now his statement essentially conceding contains a huge lie. He's been removed yeah. from Twitter for, for temporarily, but the, the lie is the facts bear me out. He says, I won the election, the facts bear me out. It's quite incredible. Uh, yeah, it is. And I can't understand why here... In England, the liars still get by with it, and why in the States the liars get by with it. And it uh, confuses me. Well, I don't, yeah, it, it confuses and frustrates me, but, but I think one trick to understanding it better is to understand they want to be lied to because they are given license to blame their whole lives on somebody else and I used to think that that was confined to unfulfilled people that that was confined to unsuccessful people to unsatisfied people but it's not of course because you know some of the richest poshest people in this country were cheerleading for Donald Trump right in their articles and waving their little flags and talking about how a Donald Trump victory would be good for us really all he ever offered to anybody was was a green light to be gross and some people need that green light to be gross they love that green light to be gross and we can sit here and philosophize and quote Freud and look for complicated reasons and sophisticated analyses but the bottom line is that for many many millions of people in America and in the United Kingdom the invitation to just hate foreigners publicly, performatively, and violently is close to irresistible. And Trump seems to have understood that in his bones from pretty much the moment he... Well, no, not at the moment he drew breath. He's obviously a product of his environment and his upbringing as well. But from the moment he stepped onto the public stage, he's had an innate understanding of how hate works. And, and he was a master at stoking it. And, well, I, some people suggesting he has now lost his mind. Uh, it was reported that people in the White House were saying that last night. But I, I don't know. I, I mean, I wonder what was there all along. I really do. Susan, thank you. It's an hour down already, believe it or not. 10.58 uh, is the time. We'll continue this conversation after the news. Remember, as I bid farewell to Susan in Finsbury Park, it, it frees up a phone line for you if you've been trying to get through and failing. Uh, the number you need is 03456060973. And many other things now on the list. So obviously Barack Obama is part of the explanation uh, through no fault of his own. Uh, he is part of the reason why America has fallen so fast, so far. Uh, Sarah Palin and John McCain, uh, obviously, uh, he brought her into the mainstream where previously, as Kevin eventually suggested, we'd succeeded in keeping that sort of toxicity out of the, the mainstream. Uh, that's 
I guess why the people who, who enjoy the toxicity, who thrive on it, are still whining about having their freedom of speech compromised. You look at, at other things, the financial crash, the uh, Islamist terrorism that kind of gave a veneer of plausibility to xenophobia and racism. What was one of the first things he did was the Muslim ban, the so-called Muslim ban, of course. And he knew that people loved it, just as he knew he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. I wonder whether those of us who don't have that bigotry built into our personalities can ever fully understand how it works. Well, we'll keep trying. Where we continue to, to, to map, if you like, the... Uh, decline of America, uh, culminating last night in scenes that I don't think any of us thought we would ever see uh, prior to Donald Trump's arrival on the political stage. Uh, we have chronicled some of the British politicians and, and media figures who enabled him, who, who promoted him, who, who cheer-led for him, but there were, of course, voices and individuals that did the precise opposite. Most obviously, perhaps, uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who, who joins me on the line now. I don't know if I've ever asked you this before, but when, when Trump was sort of stoking up hatred and, and, and racism directly regarding you, were you ever frightened? Yes. Um, there are many occasions over the last uh, four and a half years uh, where I've been frightened. I think if I'm being brutally uh, brutally blunt, when you speak to Muslims uh, around the globe, many of them have felt frightened over the last four and a half, uh, five years, because what people don't realize is it isn't just Trump. He inspires, uh, he uh, normalizes a sort of set of beliefs and behavior from others, his followers, his fans, which can lead to people, might, people like me having their life threatened literally and needing to have uh, police protection literally 24 hours a day, seven days uh, a week. And um, what you saw last night, I'm afraid, was inevitable, as heartbreaking as it is, as angry as it makes us, the seed of US democracy being attacked this way by this mob and these rioters. When, I'm not sure it was who said this, but when somebody shows us who they are, you should believe them. And Trump showed me and many of uh, your listeners who he was some years ago. It was Maya Angelou. Right. <laughs> well, so it's one of my favourite quotes. I've already yeah. used it today. That's the only reason why, why I'm giggling. So, I, I mean, when you say it was inevitable, it became inevitable when he lost the election, because I think we're probably still a bit too relieved to recognise that if it wasn't for the coronavirus, he probably would have won. And I may be too early to ask you this, but what would the next five years have looked like, the next four years have looked like, if we were looking at a second term? Well, firstly, I'm not sure if the inevitability happened when he lost the election. No. Using, using lies, division and fear uh, has been in his toolkit for the last four and a half years. And he's inspired leaders around the world, far-right, nativist, populist leaders. Look at Hungary, look at Poland, look at Brazil, uh, look in Italy and France and even in our country. And I'm hoping uh, his defeat uh, through the ballot box uh, will lead to the start of the end of uh, the rise of far right nativist populist uh, 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 leaders. My concern is if in a country like the USA, there isn't a smooth transition of power between a loser like Trump and the winner, uh, Biden and Harris, what will happen in countries like Hungary or Poland or Brazil uh, when they lose their elections as I hope they will? Because the, the, this, this feeling, which is what it is, of course, and, and it's often completely unhitched from facts. It, it, it doesn't just peter out. It has to go somewhere. That's why you're saying what happened yesterday had an inevitability to it. Yeah. We've got to, we've got to remember that 70 million plus people did vote for Trump mm. in America. We've also got to remember uh, that the tap that's been turned on where in the mainstream media lies, fears and division are normalized, but also use the word enablers but credible, decent people across the globe gave this guy the time of day to the extent we rolled out the red carpet for somebody whose views on race, on women, on LGBTQ plus people, on Mexicans, um, and I could go on. on the but did you know J Jacob Rees-Mogg wrote specifically about why we should use our best red carpet? We should use a spotless red carpet to roll out for him. It is, how much of it is excusable? Where do you personally put the line between what you call good, decent people who, who sort of fell into this situation and people who, who ran headlong into it? Well, 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 I hope those people who you know ran headlock into this will have periods of reflection on their own behaviour 
Uh, yes, of course, we should be courteous to uh, elected leaders across the globe. I've always said, though, that the bar is much higher when it's your best mate. Uh, the mm. special relationship, in my view, uh, gives us a responsibility to be straight with people who we disagree with. And I, I never understood why Theresa May, Boris Johnson, and many, 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 many others who should know better ran into his arms. And, you know, we were concerned for some time uh, that would the, you know, those of us who saw him for what he was, uh, who were, by the way, criticised. You and I have both faced massive criticism and still do today uh, about what we uh, say, uh, what we said, whether in fact they rue the fact and whether this is simply inevitable because we saw three, four, five years ago the sort of guy he was and also the sort of people he was turning from, uh, you know, ordinary punters, yes. but because of the lies, division were becoming fans and were, and I had have done the stuff we saw yesterday in Washington. Um, while I have you, uh, is COVID-19 out of control in London at the moment? Uh, yes, this virus is out of control. Uh, the NHS is on the cusp of being overwhelmed. Uh, there has been no time during this pandemic where I've been more concerned than I am today. My message to anybody listening to this is the best way you can help is to please stay at home. You should only leave your home if you've got a very, very good reason. I've been speaking to some of our brilliant, brilliant heroes in the NHS. They're stretched. James, they're stretched. Uh, they're overworked. Uh, many of them are suffering trauma that may take years to recover from. Uh, we think over the course of the next few days, we may run out of beds in London. And that's why it's so important we do our bit to help the NHS by staying at home. I, I hesitate to ask you this, it's going to sound a bit glib and, and trivial, but do you have a view on the on the 8pm clap that is being reinstituted tonight? Because it, it, it feels a little inadequate in the context of what you've just described. You know, when I, when I speak to colleagues in the NHS, mm. including members of my family, as much as they appreciate you, they really did appreciate the clap for carers uh, during those weeks in spring and uh, summer. What they really wanted is a, a proper recognition from the government in relation to how they're treated, but also that being the first and last, uh, you know, uh, peak. Uh, the best way we can help those people in the NHS is not simply to clap for them. People may want to clap, that's fine. Not simply light up buildings, we'll be doing that uh, where we can, but actually the best way to help them is by staying at home. And the best thing we can do, all of us, is to follow the medical advice, stay at home, only leave home if you've got a good uh, reason. It's really, really, really important. I say this because in addition to COVID patients, we have non-COVID winter patients. Uh, we already have exceeded uh, the supply of beds. The NHS has done an amazing job uh, adapting, being flexible, uh, but you can't invent overnight new doctors, new clinicians, new nurses, new porters, new cleaners, new engineers, new laboratory assistants. They're working incredibly, incredibly hard, and I really worry about them. And and yet, in a way, we return to some of the Trump themes now because people up and down the country and in the capital are still convinced that that politicians like you are exaggerating or lying, that there's a hoax involved, that figures are being manipulated, that lockdowns are unnecessary. I, 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 how do you how do you fix that, Sadiq Khan? Well, let me speak from personal experience. I've got a friend, uh, only 10 years older than me, he passed away uh, three weeks ago from COVID. I've got a friend who's my age, who's currently in intensive care in St George's Hospital. Uh, his family uh, are, are praying for him. They think this could be uh, him about to lose his life. I have a member of my family who yesterday spent 14 hours at St George's uh, and he's knackered and he's back there today as well. So look, uh, all I say to you is, uh, please, um, this virus is real. People are losing their lives. Uh, people will lose their lives. Many of those uh, losses of life were preventable. We can prevent an, un an unnecessary excess of lives being lost by following the advice, stay at home. Stay at home. My condolences to you, Sadiq Khan, and my thanks for your time today, and indeed for, for rescheduling Speak to Sadiq, which was due to unfold at, at 10 o'clock this morning, but for, for reasons that don't need explaining, we um, elected not to do it today. We will do it soon. The time now is 12 minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The, uh, the, I mean, the questions really ask themselves on a day like today. How, how did America move from being, in, in, whether it deserved the reputation or not, the, the land of the free, you know, the, the, the biggest democracy on the planet? How, how did it move from being this totem of, uh, I would loosely describe as Christian values, um, into being 
this petri dish of fascism that we saw yesterday. And, and I, I haven't had any really meaningful challenges yet to the idea that it is all sourced in racism because that is the only thing I can see that he offered to people. Uh, what else did he offer? Well, what else was there? What else was on the table when Donald Trump sat down and, and started telling the American people that they should vote for him? What else was he offering except an invitation to hate and blame? To hate and blame. I can't see anything else. And of course, you, you, you have to reflect at this point on how much of the media is built on precisely the same invitation. I'm still quite proud of that line I've unleashed upon you countless times about the ghost train and the speak your weight machine, but it, it, it feels a little inadequate now in the context of, of where the ghost train has taken us. You know, this, this idea that, that it is a very lucrative business to scare the bejesus out of people by warning them about an enemy that doesn't really exist. And that means that the, that the fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate. Where does the hate go? Well, it gets directed at people like our last guest, the, the, the Mayor of London. Why? You know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. They always insist these people that they think that people born of foreign parents or, or people born with foreign heritage should do more to integrate, they say, while pretending not to be racist. Well, you can't get much more integrated than getting elected mayor of a country's capital city, can you, lads? Where we continue our conversation, although feel free to bring anything to the table that I have not invited you to bring, within reason and, and the bounds of decency and legality, of course, but um, it, it is... It's really, really odd, actually. Uh, I mean, we haven't even started on Brexit yet, have we, this year? But the, the list of, just off the top of my head, Northern Ireland facing food supply disruption, MPs told, touring musicians hit by double whammy of Brexit and COVID, loads held, returned on ferries despite customs formalities, lorry traffic, uh, Hollyhead slumps, Scottish seafood exports held up, Cornish fishing boats gathering dust as EU shellfish exports halt, Brexit red tape prompts rethink on cross-channel trade, problems in first week of post-deal, car crime has changed already after Brexit, huge customs agent shortages, pan-EU food supply chains, Brits denied access to Sweden, London's lost EU share trading could be gone for good, um, and, and, and so it goes on. But there is, as I've told you, I spent the last month of last year telling you no pleasure whatsoever in um, having been right about this stuff. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible. I wonder, actually, whether I still envy people who were wrong because you're still in denial and delusion about it. But now it's Trump. And, and I don't have to put £10 in the charity pot every time I say I told you so in the context of Trump. But uh, Sadiq Khan used the word inevitability. What, what, you know, you look at the QAnon conspiracies that he embraced in his... Uh, in the last few weeks. You, you look at what his followers genuinely believed to be true. There's a lot of crossover with, with coronavirus. Um, dangerous coronavirus scepticism as well. But if once people believe things that are demonstrably untrue, it creates a, a, a monster that, it, that is, by definition, I think, uncontrollable. I, I, I love that line in Orwell. I know I've shared it with you a lot, but I'm not sure I could ever share it with you too much. There, there is truth and there is untruth. And if you... I, I slightly misquote it. I haven't got it tattooed yet. Uh, if you can hang on to the truth, even if you are the only one, you, you will not go mad. And so there have been times when you... Look, I, I tell you about the time I interviewed Roger Stone. Um... And I, 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 he's, I mean, he's a slippery character, Roger Stone, by I think anybody's standards, being pardoned by, by, by Donald Trump inevitably. But I, I, I was working at Newsnight at the time, and I asked Roger Stone whether or not he believed that Donald Trump believed the stuff he says. So Stone is a, a, a well-established uh, Washington Beltway player, you know, he, he's had fingers in all sorts of pies over the years. And I, I put it to him that when he tells a lie, he knows he's lying. He sort of winks at the base. He, he gives a little wave off stage to the to the audience. And I just, and he obviously didn't take particularly warmly to this line of questioning. But I, I, I just, raining on Inauguration Day, the size of the crowd on Inauguration Day, I think Trump somewhere inside, he believed that it didn't rain. And he believed that his crowd was bigger than Barack Obama's. And, and that's, that's crazy enough. But 
how do millions of other people then persuade themselves to ignore the evidence of their eyes and ears? That might be a question that we move towards now. I, how, and I, I appreciate the best people to speak to will be recovering addicts, people that used to be addicted to ignoring the evidence of their eyes and ears and have somehow seen the light. But I, I appreciate that that is probably still a relatively small constituency. But if you used to buy into this stuff, and I, I find it unlikely that you that you wouldn't have been possessed of very racist views at the time, but, but I'm happy to hear from you if, you if you think that you weren't. But what, what, where did this, not so much the invitation to hate and blame, but the willingness, even perhaps the desire, to believe things that somewhere inside you must know not to be true. That's the strangest element, perhaps of what we're discussing. Phone lines are open. 0345 973 is the number that you need. I, I don't know that we'll ever get our heads around that because, you know, apart perhaps via testimony from, from recovering addicts, from people who... It's a bit like a cult, isn't it? An ex-cult member is the only one who can really explain to you how cults work, I think. It doesn't matter how many books you read or how many books you write on the subject like this. Unless you've lived it, I wonder whether you can ever truly inhabit it, whether you can ever truly, truly understand it. So if you if you think you might be in that category, then you know what to do. 03456060973. Um, it, you know, it, it feels like years ago, but it was only weeks that I first heard of people who believe that children are being trafficked in order to feed their blood to Hollywood stars and, and, and Democrat politicians. And, and you, you, you begin by thinking it's a little bit like believing the Queen of England to be a lizard. And you, you feel untroubled by it because it's so pant-wettingly stupid that you can't believe it's got a grip on anything like a remotely significant swathe of the population. And then, and then you see it sort of bubbling over the surface, whether it's people claiming coronavirus is some sort of hoax or lie, whether it's people claiming that there are tunnels under London full of trafficked children whose blood is to be harvested to feed Tom Hanks, or, or, or whatever the latest madness is. And I don't get that bit, do you? The desire to believe things that, that somewhere inside you must know not to be true. Or, or am I overthinking it again? I, do, do all these people that marched on the uh, Capitol yesterday truly believe despite there being absolutely zero evidence whatsoever, over 60 utterly bogus, fatuous, spurious, specious legal cases brought by Donald Trump and his team of ridiculous, ridiculousness. Do these, do these people, yes, do they, I mean, they must actually believe that the election has been... He was president for four years. Let's pretend for a moment that the election was, in some sense... Uh, um, unfair, or, or that the, the, the election was in some sense corrupted. Who's, whose fault would that be? If you've been running a country for four years and the electoral system is bogus, whose fault would that be? And that's where the deep state comes in. Oh, he's not really in charge, you see. So once you believe one lie, which I think for me remains the idea that the colour of your skin is a mark of your character, the idea that by dint of being white you're somehow better than he and her. Once you believe that lie, once you truly believe it, you know, that's, that's what white supremacism is, a true belief. But it's untrue. But once you believe that, uh, is that what opens the door to all the other lies? So once you've signed up to the lie of white supremacism, you end up believing that the Sandy Hook shootings were a hoax? I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. And I welcome you. I invite you to do the same. 25 minutes after 11, Jim's in Edmonton. Jim, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning. How Hello. are you doing? Pretty good. What's on your mind? Oh, well, first of all, that was quite a segue you uh, had leading up to my call. Yes, right. I thought, I thought <laughs> I'm, I'd, I'm I'd roll American out the red expat. carpet. I'll roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm an American expat. I've lived here for 20 years. Yes. And, I mean, I'm just going to try to give you another perspective, okay? Mm. Um, how about, like, just a window into the American psyche? We'll look at the show X-Files. Here's a program that ran for 20 years. Yeah. All right? And its premise was conspiracy, government conspiracy. Okay, now that's just one thing. Yeah. I mean, I think okay. the average American are more concerned about what the U.S. government is going to do in their own backyard than what they get up to in the rest of the world. Okay, I watched a Panorama uh, program, I think it was about three, four years ago, perhaps, where they went over and posed as lobbyists 
and gave one of our politicians 25,000 pounds to push their agenda through, and it worked. All right, this is, this is the atmosphere that Donald Trump has come into. The average Americans don't vote because they're just disenchanted with the entire thing. They think they're all crooks. It doesn't matter. And for people to scoff and say, oh, well, there's no proof of that. Oh, it can't be true. Yes. I'm sorry, man. I just, I just think that's a little bit naive. Yeah, I mean, they're so, so you're talking about a, a, an environment of, of, of because Trump is the crook that they thought all politicians were, but but he he comes. But the thing is, is he's an honest crook, mate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he's not hiding it. You know, you say that oh, Biden sounded like a statesman, like that's a good thing. Yes, it's not. Right, it's somebody who spent their life being a polished liar taking corporate agenda and pushing it through. Are you describing you know, what you... Are, are, are you describing what you think now, or what you think yes, they think? This is what this is what I believe, and this is oh, what I've, okay. I've spoken to, to many, of my, many, many of my friends back in America. We talk about these things. You know, and you've got the so whole where, where, where would, if, if, well. I, if I asked you to, to persuade me that Joe Biden was a polished liar, what would you do? I just pointed his 50-year career. Yeah, well, go on. How else could how could how else could he possibly stay in power? I mean, this is well, the whole that's thing a question. Trump, that's, guys, a, that's a Trump, question, Trump not an answer. Outside. No, I know, but I just want you to. I, I, I don't have, I'll be honest with you, man. I don't have any facts because I, I didn't know anything about Joe Biden before I heard his name as as the elector. You but you're I mean? absolutely I, I, I certain that you're absolutely certain that he spent half a century lying. If he's a politician, he's been in the job for that long. I don't see how he could avoid it. But but you just said you'd never heard of him before. Last year, I don't need to hear. I, I don't mean, he need was to vice hear president. This, he was, this, this, this is what I think. No, no, shouting you, shouting louder doesn't make any more sense because he was vice okay. president for eight years. Right. Again, <laughs> I've never heard of him. Yeah, I've never heard of him. I mean, is it, is, it, is it fair I, to I suggest? Is, is it fair to suggest that you may not be the best qualified? Commentator uh, on American no, I politics. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to give you uh, a look into. And the I am. I'm get, I mean, like I said, and you're, you're giving me a you know, very interesting and, and I'm, look, I'm Jim. The average and, person as well. well in that, you in may that be, sense. but you've admitted you know absolutely nothing. But you're certain of your uh, prejudices. I'm certain that this is the way that it's going to be looked at by the people like uh, Trump's followers. No, yes. no. That's why I said to you: Are you telling me what you think, or are you telling me what you think yes. they think? I'm telling you what I think. I'm telling and, you, and you uh, think what has that been a Joe Biden between my friends that I've spoken no, to. No, no, I, 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 no. I understand that. I, I, I mean, I find okay. it. I find it horrible what, what you're describing, but I don't think you're lying. I, I think you're being honest. So you can look at Donald Trump and see what you described as an honest crook, and there is there exactly. all the evidence of his wrongdoing that goes back 50 years. And, and you know, we could make a list. We'd be here yep. until Christmas. Yep. yep, the man's got immense character flaws. Uh, no, I not, not character flaws. Cr criminality. I do not, I do not yeah. think. He's a good person. But I, then I, you you've know, got Joe he, Biden over there, and you've got no evidence whatsoever of his malfeasance or misbehavior, but you're absolutely convinced he's a wrong one. So, would you mind well, if I... again, I would, I, would, I, would, I would refer back to the Panorama program that I saw, which appalled me. Yes, but was he in it? People, a, a, news crew, a news crew can go over, pretend to be but, a lobbyist. But was Joe, Biden in, was, Joe, was, was, was Joe Biden in it? No. So, are, are you, in it. I've got two questions. Do you, do you recognize on any level how ridiculous you sound? And I, and I say that affectionately. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. I suppose and, so. So now. And the I'll second the question. The second question is who who did this to you? How, I mean, how, where, how, where do you think this came from? Because you weren't born like this. At some point in the last fifty years, you've become a man who's absolutely right. convinced of things, despite having no evidence for it whatsoever. How do you think that happened? Because I I have been pulled over, and I have had police in America yes. rewrite the arrest report. And I have had basically lies told in court about me, and I have had trouble in right. America. Right, and that's it. how you know okay, that Joe so Biden is, my, is, is not to be trusted. This is my personal experience with yes. the, the establishment. Oh, well, okay, being the pulled over by, by police in America. That's right. Okay. Well, it's been interesting and talking had, to you, I had, a can of beer, I had a can of beer that oh, yeah. was unopened, on, more. Yes. unopened, right. unopened in my car, Yes. and they wrote it up as an open container. And Gosh. I ended up with a DUI. And that's how you know that okay. Joe and, Biden and, is and corrupt. The reason they did that is because I was a smartass. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know okay. about that, Jim, actually. I think we might have to uh, agree to disagree on how smart you are. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where sometimes the most profound insights are unintentional, aren't they? I think that's probably one of the great beauties of phone in radio. But we continue to chronicle the, uh, I call it the decline of America, the collapse of America, except, of course, there was a narrow escape yesterday, in, in my view. And Simon Marks has been steering us through the pantomime of Donald Trump's presidency since 
before it started, and I'm delighted to say that he, he joins me on the line now. Where to start, Simon? Where to start? Well, I think we have to start with the utter catastrophe of yesterday. I'm bound to say that anyone who was surprised by the events that enveloped this city over the last 24 hours really hasn't been listening for the last four years. This was not just the inevitable consequence of a president of the United States whipping his baying mob of conspiracy theory supporters up into a frenzy uh, by lying to them not only about the election and his continuing claims, false claims, that the election was rigged against him, but then lying to them even about the constitutional authority or lack thereof that his own slavishly loyal Vice President Mike Pence could play on Capitol Hill yesterday. I mean, these events did not happen by chance. They happened because Donald Trump told a mob of, in many cases, armed conspiracy theorists that his number two, Mike Pence, at that very moment was on Capitol Hill and had the power to overturn the election results and stop Joe Biden from becoming president of the United States. And then at the end of his speech, he led them on a walk down Pennsylvania Avenue for a few seconds until, of course, he broke away and left them to it. And what did they do? They walked straight up to Capitol Hill, stormed their way into the building, actively believing that the President of the United States, who of course would never lie to them, was telling them the truth, that there was a possibility, just the frisson of a possibility, that the election results could be overturned and that Donald Trump could stay in office, even though that was absolutely never on the cards. Moments after the president made that speech, Vice President Mike Pence put out a statement saying, I haven't got that constitutional authority. I don't have the power to overturn the outcome of this election. I'm going to abide by the oath of office that I took to defend the Constitution of the United States. And with that, the break at the top of American government finally was complete. Mike Pence, a man who, as I said on Eddie's program yesterday, has never evinced any emotion about what he's genuinely thinking. He looks like Scott Tracy out of Thunderbirds as he stands by the president for four years, soaking up abuse after abuse after abuse of power. Finally, the break was complete. But it was too late because by that point, the baying mob of conspiracy theorists was tearing up the Capitol building. We now know that four people died yesterday uh, during those horrific events that threatened not just the physical cradle of American democracy, but the spirit of American democracy, about which a former Republican president, Ronald Reagan, used to call, you know, the shining city on the hill, the model for the rest of the world to emulate in ruins on on Capitol Hill because one man with the authority to be mature, to take a leadership stance, to tell his followers this isn't going to work, we're going to engage in the peaceful transfer of power as the American Constitution requires it. One man didn't have the maturity, whether it was mental, emotional, hard to know, didn't have the intellectual capacity over the last eight weeks to do what every single one of his predecessors has done and to say, I lost the election. I'm going to have to leave power. It's just astounding. I sense from your voice, well, I'll check, actually, because <laughs> I'm not sure I've, I'm any closer to, to, to being able to describe an understanding of him. Like, the, for example, today the question would be, does he really believe that Mike Pence had this power? Where everybody knows that Mike Pence doesn't. Did he, did he know what he was unleashing? Is there a plan? I don't think I've got any better grasp There's on what makes plan. him tick than I did before he became, when he first became president. Do you? Do you understand There's, him better than you did? Th th There's never a plan beyond what he thinks at any given moment is best for him. This, right. And I've spoken to senior figures who served uh, at various various points alongside him in his administration, who, who were there in the room where it happened. <laughs> and they will tell you, you've got to understand, it's only 
ever about him. It's not about the good of the country. It's absolutely not about the baying mod of conspiracy theorists who back him. It's only ever about what he believes at any given time is best for him. And there is no question, and I think that this is going to be one of the sort of post-presidency inquiries, uh, that insufficient attention has been played, uh, has been paid to his own mental state. This is not yes. a man emotionally and intellectually and psychologically equipped to serve as president of the United States. And one of the questions that everyone is, is asking here today and will be asking in the coming hours is can he even stay in office for the remaining 13 days of his term? Uh, we know that a substantial number of members of the House of Representatives are drafting articles of impeachment. Uh, they want him impeached by the House of Representatives and convicted at trial in the Senate, not simply to remove him from power, but actively to prevent him from ever being able to seek public office again. We saw Jim Mattis, uh, the former Defence Secretary, who, it should be said, for a good long while didn't say boo to a goose no, when he was serving in Donald Trump's cabinet. Mm. Yesterday saying that Donald Trump will be a man left without a country. Uh, there are whispers here that Mike Pence uh, and members of the cabinet may seek with the congressional leadership uh, to invoke Section 4 of the 25th Amendment that would see Donald Trump removed from office and Mike Pence installed as a caretaker president. I actually think that to all intents and purposes, Mike Pence is a caretaker president. In any other country, James, we would be asking ourselves, how do we know that the president actually issued that statement yeah. over the last few hours, grudgingly acknowledging that he's going to engage in a peaceful transfer of power? We haven't seen him. He's barred from Twitter and Facebook. We have no idea if he had anything to do with authoring that statement. And the resignations last night were only just beginning at the White House, there yes. will be many more of them in the hours ahead. I suppose the biggest clue that it was actually authored by him is, is the fact that it contained at least two blatant lies. <laughs> well, and probably it, lots of errant capital letters yeah, well, in various we should, places. We'll have to wait and see. Was that a deliberate reference to Hamilton, Simon, in there? Yes, yes, yes. Quite yes, right, yes, too. Absolutely, no, absolutely. just checking. I, I presumed it would be. It was absolutely masterful. Well, I didn't pay good money for those tickets. No, for I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, a final question. Uh, it... it, it What's, what's in it for the senators that were going along with it then? Because I think you're pro almost certainly right in terms of understanding Trump is understanding that it's only ever about Trump. But but your Ted Cruz and is it Josh Lawley? There were there were people Hawley who've kind of had agreed to go along with the complaint, to go along with the deceit, really, the con, the the pretense. Is is that just politicking in order to secure the support of the people that have been? reduced yeah. to supporting Trump despite the obviousness of his lies. Yeah, I mean, I think we should be absolutely clear. The Republican Party, as you and I have known it from the moment we became politically conscious, mm. does not survive this as a unitary political institution. Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, the 140 members of the House of Representatives, the ludicrous Congressman Matt Gates last yes. night of Florida, who was claiming that these conspiracy theorists, supporters of President Trump, were not conspiracy theorist supporters of President Trump. In fact, they were Antifa activists dressed up yeah, as conspiracy theorists yes. supporting presidents, uh, supporters of President Trump. These, these men have crossed the Rubicon. We, we've got QAnon conspiracy theorists who have been elected to Congress uh, in the last cycle. One of them putting out a video earlier this week saying she is uh, going to be carrying her Glock pistol wherever she goes in Washington and into the halls of Congress. So the Republican Party, as you and I know it, uh, and you could see this yesterday with Mitt Romney mm. being hounded on a plane and through uh, Salt Lake City Airport, it's over. Uh, it, it is going to split into at least two groupings, and that was on evident display yesterday uh, in the split between Mitch McConnell, who was hewing to the Constitution and saying, for the sake of America's Democratic Republic, this can't continue, and Ted Cruz, the arsonist who keeps telling everybody to stop playing with matches. <laughs> uh, that Those two people can't survive in the same political grouping uh, once the ashes of yesterday are, are, are cleaned up and thrown away and Donald Trump is disposed of, whether uh, disposed of in words word and action, mm. as in removed from the White House, or simply just isolated and ignored by Vice President Mike Pence and the remaining members of the Cabinet over the next 12 or 13 days. 
Simon Marks, absolutely sto astonishing coverage, as always. Thank you so much. And I suspect that, like me, it's it's in the last few years you've come to realise why that um, that phrase, may you live in interesting times, is considered a curse by the Chinese. I never realised it was a curse until quite recently because, of course, as journalists, this is ostensibly great for business. But, my God, it can be a very de dispiriting and, and depressing business to watch what human beings are capable of. Um, I mentioned Hamilton, a uh, room where it happens. There's a quote from Alexander Hamilton himself that I'll share with you shortly, which in many ways presages the existence of a politician like Trump. Here is Alexander Hamilton uh, almost predicting Donald Trump with a, with a couple of caveats. I think that the idea that Trump has the advantage of military habits is, is clearly not true, um, dodging the draft on multiple occasions. Uh, and, of course, insulting genuine military heroes like, like John McCain. But I love this line. Uh, when a man unprincipled in private life, desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, possessed of considerable talents, despotic in his ordinary demeanour, known to have scoffed in private at the principles of liberty, when such a man is seen to mount the hobby horse of popularity, to join in the cry of danger to liberty, to take every opportunity of embarrassing the general government and bringing it under suspicion, to flatter and fall in with all the nonsense of the zealots of the day, it may justly be suspected that his object is to throw things into confusion, that he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind. Wow. Sarah Churchwell is the Professor of American Literature and Public Understanding of the Humanities at the University of London. She is also the author of Behold America, and she joins me on the line now. Alexander Hamilton knew what he was talking about, Sarah. Well, he did tend to, didn't he? I mean, it is um, it is remarkable, I think, to listen to the words of many of the founding fathers uh, arguing against exactly what we're seeing now. And then what we see is a, a kind of um, misappropriation or perversion of um, the idea of the founding principles of, of democracy in America being, you know, taken in vain, in my view, by the people who stormed the Capitol. I mean, pretty clearly, uh, the um, people setting up the original American government did not want people, you know, American citizens to be trying to topple it. Um, and they warned against despotism. They warned against uh, um, the what was called at the time the man on horseback, right? The kind of the tyrant figure who could come in and mm. could, you know, through his magnetism, uh, um, you know, uh, lead to this, to, to exactly what we're seeing. Do you think it's peaked? Uh I don't know. I, that's the that's the problem with a yes, peak. Of right? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. You won't know until we're on the downside of it. I hope it has. Um, I'm concerned that we're not seeing the kind of denunciation um, from the steps of the Capitol building by the Democratic leadership that I'd like to be seeing, much less the Republican leadership. We need our leaders to stand up and to say this simply will not be tolerated. And at the moment, we're getting some pretty mealy mouthed. Uh, uh, you know, and we only had 13 arrests, four people died. Um, if, if they had come in with the machine guns, which, as we all know, are widely available in the United States, mm. they could have taken out the government. I, I mean, I, even, even I'm a little bit stopped in my tracks by that simple statement. They, they, indeed, they could. What, what, it's not your field of expertise, but were you, well, A, surprised by what you saw yesterday, and B, surprised by the paucity of, of, of law control, of law and order? Uh, I was, and like many uh, um, around the world, I am I'm still watching the video footage to try to mm. make sense of it. Um, it certainly does look like uh, in places that the police were were opening the barriers, but although some people were saying that maybe that was actually trying to manage the the violence, I don't I don't know. Um, but I do think that it's striking to me that when we look at the response to say the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland this summer, when we saw riot gear, we saw militarized police uh, coming against suburban white mothers who were standing peacefully in protest, which by the way is a First Amendment right under the Constitution. Yeah. Um, they brought in you know riot gear SWAT teams 
to bring down those people. And these people stormed the Capitol building and then were allowed to walk out complaining that they got maced, which we again have seen on, I'm sure lots of people have seen that video on, on social media of this woman saying that, you know, she objects to the fact that the police maced her when she stormed the Capitol. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, what it is, I mean, we're moving into, into uh, also you remind me of the, the tactics that were deployed to remove peaceful protesters from a public highway so that Donald Trump could wave a Bible about outside a church. Uh, the tactics Precisely. there were considerably more stringent than the tactics deployed yesterday. And Would you call it an attempted coup or would that be hyperbole? Well, it certainly was, uh, what I would call it is like a, a staged coup, if you see what I mean, because yeah. I don't know how serious the attempt was. Um, and as I say, they didn't come in brandishing machine guns. They were performing the possibility of a coup. They wanted to make clear to everybody that they could, and they felt entitled to, take the government if they chose to. They felt entitled to sit in the speaker's chair and to, you know, walk off with bits of, you know, government property. And they wanted to demonstrate that they were able to do that. So it was a show of power. Um, if that, and in that sense, it was very serious indeed. Um, how, you know, were they seriously attempting to overthrow the U.S. government? Well, no, because then they all walked out after they'd had. There was no problems. end game either. Where, where does that yeah, power exactly. go now? Where does that power go now? Well, that's. I think that's exactly the right question. I think you absolutely put your finger on it. And and I don't. And that's why I said I don't know if right. it peaks. I don't yeah. know. We're all watching this unfold in real time. And that's that's probably the most terrifying thing of all, isn't it? The uncertainty. F final question. I, I mean, you've chronicled and, 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 and followed this more closely than most. Do you have, I've asked a couple of guests this today, because I'm embarrassed by my own answer to this question. Do you have a better understanding of what makes Donald Trump tick now than you did at the beginning of his presidency? Um, well, no, I don't. But I will say that I have felt that what made him tick was clear from the beginning to me. And I have been writing and speaking about yes, it from the beginning. So to me, this is quite consistent. Um, he is a, a corrupt opportunist power grabber. That's what he wants. And the power has gone to his head over the last four years. He's, he's a, you know, he's a, a, a pathological liar, as we all know. And he's seen what power brazening out through lies can achieve for him. It got him the presidency. And now he's seeing whether it can't keep him the presidency. But that's what he does. He just, he throws stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And, um, and, and the more that his followers, uh, you know, uh, uh, mm. build up his lies and feed him his poisonous paranoia and everything, then the more that he, he tries to, to get away with. Um, you, you used the F word quite early in your writings. <laughs> um, I presume you feel quite vindicated now. Well, I mean, I, I, I would hesitate to use the word vindicated because it sounds like there's any pleasure that I would take in oh, this. Um, I, get that. I would have dearly <laughs> loved to have been proven wrong. Um, really, I really wanted America to prove me wrong. But um, so far, my country is not proving me wrong. And I really wish it would. Well, we're very grateful to have you here, both in, in the country and on the show. Professor Sarah Church, well, many thanks indeed. Sarah, as I said, is a professor of American literature and public understanding of the humanities at the University of London, most pertinently for the purposes of this conversation and this period in British history. Um, she's also, I well, beg your pardon, world history. She's also the author of Behold America. It's coming up to 12 noon. We'll catch up with Rachel Venables shortly on the latest developments regarding... Um, uh, test and trace and uh, Office of National Statistics figures. Sky News is reporting rather worryingly that the surgery at which Matt Hancock elected to turn up today for a photo opportunity regarding the vaccines has not taken delivery of the expected vaccines. But I am going to need a lot more evidence than that to, to, to conclude that things are going badly. I said to you yesterday about 364 times, just because they muffed everything up yesterday doesn't mean they will muff up whatever it is they're charged with doing today or indeed tomorrow. And the vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine... Uh, if it has hiccups, we're still doing, and I, I, I think international comparisons are not just valid, but actually important. We are still doing a better job on getting vaccines into people's arms than most other countries in the world. And if however much you may hate or suspect or fear the current government and the echoes of what we've seen in America are, are, are clear, run through the cabinet like Blackpool through a stick of rock, um, you cannot wish for anything other than success with regard to the vaccine. So it is to be hoped that this is a minor 
and temporary hiccup. But it is my job to tell you that a doctor at the surgery visited by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, this morning to mark the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and indeed to take advantage of the photo opportunity has just told Sky News that their surgery has yet to receive any of the vaccine. Um, they were expecting it to arrive today. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, a rare show uh, or a special show uh, given the events in America yesterday. Donald Trump, uh, I mean, as Simon Marks reminded us, there's no way of knowing whether or not his hand went anywhere near the paper. But given that it contains at least two blatant lies, I um, uh, would suggest that that is evidence it probably was authored by him. But, but a statement um, essentially talking about a peaceful handover, a, a, a concession. And yet it was the capital and the footage it doesn't get any less shocking the more you watch it actually uh, as sarah churchill reminded us a moment ago people will be pouring over recordings to, to look at the question of how the hell these people got in to the capital it's quite incredible to, to to reflect upon the failure of of policing especially when you remember the outfits let alone the numbers that were photographed in um, preparation for the Black Lives Matter protests that have unfolded across America in the last year. Uh, the, the, the cops those days looked like RoboCop. I mean, they looked like something out of a, a, a out of a sci-fi film. And yet, this planned and widely publicised assault upon American democracy seems to have taken the police by surprise. Um, that actually did that mention of the possibility of the police letting people through the lines. That that is being reported increasingly as a, a, a response to the or an acknowledgement of the inability to stop so you see that you can find two examples of the police response to the mounting crowds one is the police being overrun by the crowds and sort of clambering over the bodies and the, and the, and the fences to get into the building and then at, at other locuses if that's a word you, you see the police sort of stepping back but it, it isn't it's not as if they're giving permission it's more as if they're admitting defeat before getting battered i think at least but as as we all know it will take a while for the dust to settle and the facts to emerge give me a moment actually poor old kerry's been on hold for about half an hour actually, i'll talk to kerry she's been are you still there kerry I am, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't believe they left you hanging like that. I've spoken to two okay? guests and Rachel Venable since you were on, since you were first. Can you remember why you were at? Can you remember who I am? Do you know what, what day it is? Just about. <laughs> on, what did you want to say? Um, well, personally, I'm really angry. Yeah. I'm just so angry at our own government. Obviously, we can be angry at everything happening in America. Of course. But I just, I find it quite nauseating, all of the kind of faux outrage coming from our own government Mm. people and our own government, our own media, um, people who refuse to condemn Trump and everything he was doing before, who are now disgusted by it. And I think there's, there's I a lot example, of that. Go there's a lot of hand washing lot going on. Of that going on, yes. isn't there? And um, this is just one example. But Jeremy Hunt was on Peston last night, right. and this is a direct quote. He said, "One of the unexpected consequences of tonight may actually be the end of Trump's political career because I think it will be so damaging to his credibility." And I actually couldn't believe what I was hearing. Why not? It was unexpected, was it? Tonight, oh, I see what you mean. lost all his um, credibility. Tonight, not the racist stuff he said, not the accusations of sexual assault, not during the summer having his own people gassed in the streets for PR stunts, yeah. not the firing of rubber bullets. I just think, how can you say that that got rid of his credibility and this is the same man who and you had khan sadiq khan on earlier mm. when jeremy hunt was foreign secretary he refused to condemn a tweet where trump retweeted the woman who shall not be named who called london londonistan now we just heard khan say that words like that yes. were frightening for him they put him at risk yet we had a home set sorry a foreign secretary who said that Trump had his own style. He refused to condemn what he said. He said that he agreed with the sentiment. Now, we had people like Kevin earlier, who you had on the show. God, you, I'll tell you what, you were getting ready for this, weren't you, while you were on hold for <laughs> half an hour? It does my head in, because I can we tell. act as of if course. this is so unexpected, but it's not. We all saw this coming. Trump had so many fascist tendencies. We knew the things. Was it the ban on Muslims? Was it the calling Mexicans drug dealers? Yet we have similar things happening here all the time. I mean, I know it's slightly different, but we all remember, or maybe it, it is distant memory and so much happens these days that we forget yes. what's been said but 
Boris Johnson said that Obama being part Kenyan made him anti-British. Yes. Like, we have that kind of sentiment in our own media, and then we pretend that it's something that's far-flung, it could never happen here. Well, you, you don't, and I don't. I mean, there are plenty of us that have been staring it squarely in the face and describing what we see, honestly. I, I didn't watch Peston last night, so I, 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 my producer tells me that the point you referred to was more of a technicality about what the consequences of impeachment may be, but we, we don't need to get... To get into that, clearly... Well, he, he said that the um, um, Republican Party are unlikely to want him back now. And that was actually yes. how he ended the No, sentence. okay. No, well, that, I, I mean, he's, so he, but he's right and wrong, isn't he? Because you, he you, is, you're frustrated that, by the... <laughs> yeah, but it did. That's the point. It shouldn't have done, yeah. but it did. And that's the, that's the weird thing. And, I, I mean, to add to your burdens, it, uh, personally... I find it highly unlikely that any of the people who, who didn't just excuse and, and, and look away, but actively endorsed and championed Donald Trump's toxicity, exactly. they're not going to face any consequences at all. They'll all be at work today, grinning away and, and patting themselves on the back and pretending that they had nothing whatsoever to do with the rise of fascism in the United well, States yeah, of America. Well, yeah, our own government included, because it wasn't too long ago that Jacob Rees-Mogg said that Trump would be our biggest ally after Brexit, and I truly believe that the only reason our government are condemning him in the slightest is is because he didn't win the election. Had he won the election, I know had he won the election last yeah. night wouldn't have happened, but all the previous things he said that made him racist, made him a do you, do you understand it? Because, I mean, people like us can sound, and, and I, I stress the us on this, because I, I'm not accusing you of anything that I know I'm, I'm not guilty of myself. Yeah. But it... it, it, it I, I don't know about you, but I've wondered over the last four years whether whether it was helpful to, to use some of the words that we have used in the course of this conversation. And I've got a horrible feeling I might have stepped back from I them. I think so. I think that it's really easy for us to be called woke, to be called yeah. lefty, to be called whatever they want to call us. But, you know, it's cliché, but that old saying, the only necessary thing for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Well, yes. What about when you excuse him? What about when you excuse these actions? I think that let them call you names. You can't let these things go unsaid. Like That's why yesterday happened. People can say it was unexpected, but it wasn't unexpected. It was certainly think, wasn't unexpected. And, and I, the, just, yeah, go on. I think that this whole stepping back because we don't want to be called certain words, we don't want to be seen in a certain way. If you don't call out this kind of behaviour, it'll happen. You will have people calling up. You will have people like the Mayor of London saying he was frightened. You will have people like your guests earlier saying yeah. that they're worried for their kids. I don't think us being scared that we might be called too woke is a good enough excuse to not do anything and not call things out because that's how we get people like Boris Johnson being the Prime Minister when he said overtly racist things. That's why you get people like Trump in power. And there was that article, of course, recently, I think The Independent got hold of it, of a, of a Conservative Constituency Association sending out advice on how to be more like Trump and how to deploy the tactics that Trump has deployed in order to, 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 to mislead and, and deceive people. Kerry, that was worth, actually, come back a second, that was well worth <laughs> the wait. It really <laughs> was. No, thank you. Have you called me before? No, I'm sorry, well, no. Please call me again, okay? <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. No, thank nice to speak to you. Likewise, and I, and I shall let you off for kind of implying that I might have been a bit of a coward in that confession about well, whether you should stop calling it fascist or racist or... You know, but outfits like Andrew Neil Spectator pay people to, to turn racist into a joke, don't they? They write, wait, I think it's Ron Liddell, writes racist with a W. Is it trying to defuse the accusation, trying to mock the accuser? And, and it, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that I think perhaps it works. And you need events like yesterday to remind you why you're on the side of the angels and not on the side of the opposite, which is why last night, I, uh, I, I in a state of... Um, emotion I, I tweeted this we told you we effing told you time and time and time again your people attacked us they sent us death threats they amplified your lies about us and you never stopped encouraging them tomorrow you'll be back on air and back in print pretending it's nothing to do with any of you conversation continues an awful lot of love for for, for kerry coming in maybe we should leave everyone on hold for half an hour obviously i'd have to start work at, at half past nine do the monologue while nick's still talking um you might notice and then keep all the callers on hold for half an hour because it would create the kind of brilliance that kerry just brought to the party so um passing on the compliments at 20 minutes after 12 is the time continuing this question or just a general conversation really um it's been incredibly fertile hasn't it and illuminating but but the the, the, the thing I can never really fully understand, and I, and I do return to the 
cultish nature of this level of political uh, similar similarities to Brexit. I know some of you aren't ready to admit that yet, but you will. Um, hopefully, it won't. I, I can't see, in fact, how it ever would take an event as as kind of epic as what we saw in America yesterday, just to drive home the point uh, uh, that that many of us have warned about. I can't know. Of course, it's not going to happen. But the the, the idea that you will now believe things that you know not to be true, I think they call it cognitive dissonance, or it's probably what Orwell called doublethink, isn't it? Where you can sustain two contradictory positions at the same time. I write about it in my new book, in my latest book, and I, and I use myself as the example, lest you think I'm um, uh, kind of being holier than thou or picking on people. I talk about the times in my life, uh, uh, and even now, where I realise I am guilty of doublethink or cognitive dissonance or holding two simultaneously uh contradictory positions it, 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 and and doing it sincerely and yet on this kind of scale i haven't got a clue how this happens I just, how on earth you 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 end up believing that donald trump was cheated of of the election after you know seeing what would you sum it up the moment that best encapsulates what a ludicrous bogus stupid claim that is probably the four seasons garden center press conference do you remember that I, I don't know. That was that was kind of up there for me, but still, some people persist in in. I don't know. And they're not pretending. That's the point I'm trying to make. They're not pretending to believe it. So there's two reasons why you might publicly subscribe to nonsense. The first is that you believe it, and the second is that you pretend to believe it in order to achieve something. So that would describe Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is a very clever man. I think he graduated from Harvard in, in, in law. He, he, he is not stupid enough to think that there's anything at all in Trump's claims. But there is something in Trump's claims for Ted Cruz. So Ted Cruz signs up to the, to the bandwagon, knowing it will fail, but knowing also that he... Like Johnson and Brexit. Johnson supported leave because he thought they'd lose, but it would be good for Boris Johnson. In other words, he sacrificed the health of the United Kingdom upon the altar of his own ambition. But hey-ho, you know, that's what you voted for. And, and you have to then pretend that you did vote for that. In the same way that he has to pretend that it is a good idea. So I get that side of it, where, where self-interest comes in. But for ordinary punters, presented with things that you can prove are not true, like whether it rained or not, and I keep coming back to that, whether it rained or not, how big the crowd was on Inauguration Day. The desire to believe on true things is, is, is the thing that perhaps those of us who don't suffer from it or who don't have it will never fully grasp. If you can help me out with that, I will give you the money myself. Dana is, uh, Dana, I beg your pardon, is in Windsor. Dana, what can you tell us? Hi, hi. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to kind of echo uh, what the, the love that you're getting about Carrie, yes. um, because I couldn't agree more with everything that she was saying. Um, I originally called in because I think it was Kevin, the caller earlier, yes. who's an American expat. Yeah, so oh, no. my husband was, was it Kevin? The, the fellow in Edmonton, Jim, I think, in Edmonton. Jim, he called okay. himself an expat because, of course, he's, he's white, so he can't be an immigrant. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm an immigrant, too. <laughs> And um, I've been here only four years, but it, I actually moved in December right after the 2016 election oh, gosh. and have been watching sort of, it's like getting off the bus and then watching it yes. slowly have a car, a, an accident, you know. Um, and he, some of the things that he was saying were just making me so angry. But the first thing is that, you know, when he was calling uh, Biden a, a polished liar and um, yes. Trump an honest crook, yes. I... I just, like, I always have to remind people that Biden was born with a stutter. And so he, just like George the VI, has had to practice speaking and oh, making cool. sure that every word he says is a word that he will be able to pronounce without stuttering. And it's so easy in this sort of culture of unkindness to forget that, like, these are human people with actually human issues. Yes. And his, his speech is often lampooned i guess but he's well the cognitive doing, there, there were there were allegations that he was in in some sort of cognitive decline or or, or that they were covering up his medical dish i mean he is an old man but he he is on the right. ball and and i felt last night the the the, the evidence was incontrovertible that he was both statesmanlike and um and and fully across the situation yeah. and across the scenes but our friend in edmonton was was uh, adamant that that's not what and in a way he was right i mean he was describing himself i think our friend and he was sort uh -huh. of saying i don't like seeing people like joe biden being all calm and, and measured and sensible i like donald trump's 
honest crookery, whatever the hell that means. In other words, I like being lied to, and that's the point at which we all part company. You either like being lied yeah. to or you hate being lied to, and the people right. who like to be lied to have been in the driving seat now for, for a few years on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, and it's it's infuriating because as, as an American, you know, and, and he was talking about how his Trump supporter friends back home, and I cannot believe that I can admit this, but I have family members that yeah. are Trump supporters. But do you know, so and, do I, actually. I, I didn't yeah. realise that. Not, not, not biological family, well, not family family, but right. um, God, God sort of close connections, but uh, children of my parents' close friends who, who've moved to America. It turns out that uh -huh. they, were, they were Trump supporters first time round. I haven't caught up with the second time round. I know. I, I, you tend you tend not to want to want to know yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just hope, hope that they've changed. But uh, you know, he said um, that caller Jim said that uh, you know Americans are more interested in what's happening in their backyard. But but and that's probably true. But look what's happening in our backyard. Mm. Like that's that's not the picture that you want to be showing the world. How can you be proud of this? No. Well, this and, is this is know, the this is the best present of all for for countries like Russia, most obviously Russia, where exactly. the, the, the offer yeah. of Western democracy, which toppled Putin's pal in Ukraine, is now looking considerably less attractive than it did before they got Donald Trump into the White House. Right, right. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so I'm No, so I, I, I can tell you are. But final question, <laughs> final question. Your, your, your family members who voted for him, what, what were they yes. expecting to get from him? What was the, what was the reward? I, I mean, it's going to sound like a horrible thing to say. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. But what was happening before wasn't working for them. It wasn't working for them financially or socially. Sure. So I think that they just wanted to shake up. I yeah. really think that that's where it came from. And and I think then once you start to get sort of indoctrinated into whatever whoever you follow on social media, yes. it's hard. It is it is hard to separate what's what's the reality from from you know what you believe I, it's 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 a numbers game i think sometimes yeah. i think there's so many people there signing up to the same nonsense that you can it's a much easier job to convince yourself that it's not nonsense at all right exactly it's it's uh, it's it, but it's just want to say like it it's so embarrassing it's so uh, you, you want to be you, as an american you sort of are grown you're, you're raised to think that we're an example for the world which is i know a ridiculous thing but that's what that's what we kind of we every morning we say the pledge of allegiance yes of course I, I, <laughs> it, it's going to be a long time before that even whether even if it's a slightly bogus belief it's going to be a long time before it can come back isn't it right and i'm a teacher here in in windsor and i the first thing that i usually do when something like this is happening on kind of the global stage is look and see how i can speak to my kids the next time i see them in, in lessons yes. and how because yes. they're, they're going to ask me about what i think about this and i instantly looked online for some support from teachers in the states and this woman put together a whole google slideshow about how to talk to our kids about like if they're feeling safe and how to how to and the fact that that we're america in 2021 and we have to talk to our kids how to feel safe because and it's entirely self-inflicted. That's that's the amazing thing, exactly. isn't it? It's not a yeah, terror exactly. attack. Well, it is a terror attack, but it's it from is within. A terror attack. The, the definition of terrorism is forced violence because of a political gain, and that's that's exactly what happened last night. People died. Uh, yes, they did. Four people, I think, one one shot and three of, of, of medical emergencies. Dana, thank you very much indeed. Once again, I, I find myself reeling from the calibre of the quality and the course, as ever, the quantity of the calls into the programme today. But, but by way of some light relief, goodness knows we could do with a giggle. This, I read the first line of this with a with a, a sort of roll of the eyes and then read the rest of it and, and my smile grew with each line. Mr James O'Brien, you are as bad as Trump. Oh, I tell me more. Deciding to pull the mystery hour without gaining the vote to do so from the people. It's the highlights of my week. The one hour of rest from wall to wall negativity. Please don't ever pull it again, whatever is happening. Make LBC great again <laughs> by not dropping mystery hour. Yes, that is quite funny. So is the idea of a fellow who put 10 grand on Donald Trump to win the election, uh, now asking people to pay him for financial advice. If that doesn't raise a smile, then, then nothing will. It's half past 12. 25 to 1 is the time. I, I suppose all racists are liars, aren't they? In that they, they, they lie to themselves. They believe the lies, but from the outside, for objectively, all, all racists are liars. So racist liars is almost a... a a, a, a tautology, but if you're interested in, because they're not going to wake up suddenly and go, oh yes, crikey, how embarrassing, I, I was a massive racist 
liar for years, or I supported a massive racist liar for years. If you are wondering, because I appreciate that most people um, don't keep a, a close eye on social media, which is the best place to go if you want to find out what the other side is thinking. Um, by other side, I mean racist liars. And on this side, you just have people who aren't racist liars. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. So the current, I mean, it breaks down at roughly 50-50. There was a, is it, is it, how do you pronounce it? Is it Parlay, the social media platform for, for people who like racist lies? I, I, I forget. But anyway, it, it breaks down roughly 50-50 on there between people claiming that, it, that the riots and the um, invasion of the Capitol building was actually, it was left-wing people in disguise. It was a sort of Antifa um, plot or conspiracy. And then the other half of that constituency are, are posting photographs of themselves actually in the middle of the protests. So, so you, that, that's one way the racist liars are keeping the balloon inflated. And I think this is brilliant. I actually thought this was a joke. But there are now people in this country claiming that there are parallels to be drawn between a, 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 an insurrection, a, an attempted coup, an invasion of, of the... Uh, American equivalent of the Parliament, and those of us who would have quite liked a second referendum, people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, who, who suggested we should have two referendums on the European Union, one to decide whether we want to leave, and then another when we know what the terms of the referendum would be. So as long as you forget that people like Jacob Rees-Mogg called for that, then you can just about, I suppose, sustain the idea that there are parallels to be drawn between what you saw in America yesterday and what you saw... So what it is, is, is it's a claim that... Claiming an election result was corrupt is the same as asking for another election, you see. That's, I, but, hey, it's been a while since these people were in touch with what the rest of us would recognise as reality, so perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised by the latest contortions. But my job is to keep you informed, and that is what is currently going on. So, so on, on one side of the Atlantic, you've got people claiming that the disgusting scenes you saw had absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump supporters and were actually all undertaken and designed by Donald Trump's opponents in order to make Donald Trump's supporters look bad. And on this side of the Atlantic, you've got people claiming, with a, apparently with a straight face, that there are parallels to be drawn between calls for a second referendum in the aftermath of Brexit, particularly, of course, as it became clear that many, many, many of the claims made about Brexit in the run-up to the first referendum were just wrong, plain and categorically wrong. That is apparently equivalent to um, uh, breaking through police lines and invading the capital in America. So I guess it's fair to say that these people aren't going to be embracing normality, reality and decency anytime soon. 12.38 is the time. Jennifer is in Westminster. Jennifer, what can you tell us? Hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. You're very um, welcome. First of all, uh, you're one of the pragmatic people that I enjoy listening to because it's sort of you're saying everything I'm thinking. So thank you. You say mm -hmm. it more succinctly than I can. Thank you. Um, and as another American that's calling in, yes. this time a New Yorker who comes from the same place as Donald Trump. Right. And I think, and, and I am a Republican, I'm a Lincoln Republican. I haven't voted Republican in decades. No. So that tells you something. Yes, but it does. I'm, I think it, it's sort of, you know, I'm still saying I am because, you know, it's sort of like the con people say here, I didn't leave my party, my party left me, right? And I think what you're seeing is a combination of a few things. You're seeing the decline of basic education and, and civic studies. Yeah. You know, it's, there are reports that in the last 20 years, there's been a drastic reduction in the teaching of civics education. And I mean, you don't have to be a, a constitutional law expert to just read basic U.S. Civics 101, but I think that's important. And then you've got rural America. It's been left behind. And yes. again, that's due to education and government policies, which fuels this whole thing about how bad the government is to you. And, you know, my country, let's get real, it's super afraid of a change in America. Mm. I'm the child of Latin American immigrants that they... <laughs> sweated, bled, cried, and they found the American dream the super hard way. Um, and I am here in London today because, of, you know, me believing that their efforts uh, are something I want to aspire to, working hard. Yes. You know, and you also have to realize that that sudden strategy that people talk about, it's basically become the national strategy for several years now. And, you know, to that American Connect point, we do love a conspiracy theory, man. We really love it. And we also why love why is that? Why, why do you think that is? Is it, is it? I mean, it goes right back to, I'm thinking of 
Freemasonry and, and dollar bills, aren't I? I mean, it, it, it just my cursory understanding of the issues, there's always been a, 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 a an enthusiasm for conspiracy theories that I don't think is reflected on this side of the Atlantic. Why do you, having having a foot in both camps, why, why do you think that is? I think it's this thing that's just embedded in us that question everything. Sadly, now, we're just questioning everything that doesn't suit our means. <laughs> you know, we were yeah. always taught, question it all. Because, you know, they're always, someone's always trying to get you. Nothing's free. That's, that's so weird, isn't it? Because it should have the opposite. Questioning everything sounds yeah. like a really healthy and good thing to do. Yeah. But you're suggesting yeah. that it leads to believing nonsense. I think now it does. Yeah? I think sadly now it does. You know, I think if we look at Facebook, Facebook was created to judge college girls on how hot they were. Yeah. And now you've got educated people um, using that to analyze politics and decide who they're going to vote for, which is pretty bonkers, right? You know, and I, Americans also love watching a snake oil salesman at work. They love it. They're, they're trying to see, you know, you know, it's that guy who's got the, the, the shell game, right? Like, where's the peanut under the shell? Americans love it. They love it because it's sort of like they, they're trying to see how smart they are, how good they yeah. are at catching hustle. Are we good at catching a hustle? And the thing is, that's become so prevalent now that everything's a hustle. Now the media is trying to hustle you. Everything's trying to hustle you. Yeah, okay. Everything except one person is trying to hustle you. Uh, so I, which I just, is crazy. I'd love to hear your answer to this question uh, because th this is sort of a point of contention that I, I don't want to pick a side on. How clever is Trump? I mean, how much of this is just a sort of almost a almost a lizard brain, you know, a, a kind of just an instinctive ability to harvest hatred and how much of it is a plan, how, how much of it is by design and how much of it is by sort of despicable instinct. I'm going to say this as a New Yorker. The dude is a moron. <laughs> but. <laughs> Go on, but, big but coming. But, yes. but he's, he's got one thing behind him. He's got that. New York, that grifter thing, that New York thing where he wants to hustle all the time. He wants to find the hustle. And he, he will fight to fight to find the hustle. And the thing is that people have probably never seen this before. Yeah. Uh, we New Yorkers, <laughs> people in New Jersey, we see it all done. So we see him coming. You know, once I was walking on the street and he was in the way and let's just say it wasn't an interesting situation. This was before he was on reality or anything. Yeah. But we New Yorkers have all had some kind of run-in with him or his family in New York City. Yes, I've and heard it's this. It's never positive. I've heard, so how, positive. how then, final question, um, how's he pulled it off then? If it, because it's, it's all very well us sitting here in, in, in what could be described as a sort of echo chamber, although you describe yourself as a, a, as a Lincoln Republican, so that would be a silly accusation. But we are in broad agreement on this issue. And, and if it's all so straightforward and so simple and easy to understand, how on earth did he get away with it? And I, I think that comes to my last point, uh, enabling, enabling him, yeah, right? Yeah. The GOP has enabled him. The GOP is responsible for this. People are like, oh, you know, he created... No, he didn't. He didn't. He just used it to his best interest, and he succeeded. And it's really sad. And, you know, to a lesser extent, let's get real, the Democratic leadership, most of it, mm. is also partly to blame for mm. allowing the GOP to continue doing it. You know, they, they, cried, they, they cried at the wrong time and in the wrong way. Yes. And, you know, you have, you actually had Republicans coming together to fight this. That's how crazy it got. Because what we're seeing now is not Republicanism. Republicanism is about state rights. Yeah. So there's no reason to go to the Capitol to actually <laughs> yes, protest. You're, you're quite right, but these people wouldn't know what the word means. So, so the Lincoln Project has played a huge role then in, in, in what we've Absolutely. seen in the last 12 months. You're the second American. So I was chatting to a friend last night about it, and, and he was adamant that their role is, is absolutely immense in, in, the, in the successful toppling of Donald Trump. It was before we saw the scenes unfold yesterday. Jennifer, you've Jennifer, may I just say really quickly, it's yes, not only Republicans, it's also veterans. Yeah. You know, I have veterans in my family that fought for that country for yeah. the right of everyone. And that's why today we saw that the Republic, the Republic still stands, and it will forever. You know, this, the Constitution was 
existed before that dude with a twinkle in his daddy's eye. <laughs> and it's going to continue to exist way past once he's gone. <laughs> Although the memory of you saying on my show that dude is a moron will last rather longer than perhaps um, some of the other things that we've heard in the last few days. Thank you, Jennifer. I wonder how many, I wondered how many days it would take for, for this to break. I, I, I must have missed it. Um, Daniel Hannan, yes, he's still around. I think he's on his way to the House of Lords, has already called for Boris Johnson to get rid of loads of e consumer and worker protections that were introduced while we were members of the European Union. <sighs> Keith's actually not in today, so I don't know who's in charge of the tin. Who's, Will, have you got the tin? Has anyone got the tin? I might have to put another tenner in the tin for this. So a leading Tory credited with inspiring Brexit Oh, poor soul having that on his CV, has urged Boris Johnson to cull a raft of EU consumer and worker protections. Now the UK has the freedom to act. Um, also wants to make life a bit easier for hedge funds, according to this, because, yeah, I, I think, you know, won't someone think of the hedge funds? Go on, get the tin ready, Will. I told you so. 12.50 is the time. I'm allowed to say I told you so with regard to Donald Trump without putting money in the charity box because... I've, um, uh, well, I, I make up the rules as I go along, and that's the latest one. So I did tell you that this, would, something like this would happen. I told you that he was unleashing fascism on America. I, I've just seen why Camp Auschwitz is trending on Twitter, and um, it's gross, as you'd expect. Um, I, I can see people uh, claiming that Black Lives Matter bear responsibility for what happened at the Capitol yesterday. The problem is that once you open your heart to racist lies, you don't get to close it again, unfortunately, uh, until you get rid of the racist lies, until you reject the racist lies. Once you open your heart to this stuff, anything goes next. White supremacism introduces a lie to the heart of your identity that, that then leaves the door wide open and unclosable on all manner of other lies. And, and that is, I'm afraid, part of the reason why we are where we are. Andrew is in Hay on Why. Oh, you lucky fella. I love that. I love Hay on Why. What would you like to say, Andrew? Oh, uh, Good afternoon. Um, it's the irony of cancelling Mystery Hour while you try and unpick the biggest mystery of all of how we've ended up where we are. And, uh, you know, a couple of people have suggested that some of my callers this hour deserved Ray Liotta's, but um, it doesn't work like that, as you know. But there we are. Carry on. No, that's it. Um, so basically, I've been on a bit of a journey myself um, politically over the last 12 months. Um, yeah. I was on Facebook, social media, uh, avid reader of the Daily Mail, um, so I was, of course, pro-Brexit. Right. Uh, Donald Trump was a hoot. You know, really? Boris was exactly what we needed. Um, you know, two fingers up to the uh, sort of political elite. Yes. You know, get someone in who's not a politician to, to shake things up. Yes. Um, but I had a bit of a run-in um, with a post I put on Facebook, which caused me an issue at work. Um, so I just made the decision to come off. Um, so I cancelled my Facebook account back in May, June time, during the first lockdown. Um and from that, I started more listening listening to your show, uh, mm. looking up different facts and opinions. And then I think the more you listen to different types of people talk about an issue, um, and then you sort of referee it with the facts, you suddenly realise the things you were so angry about seeing on Facebook um, and in the Daily Mail yes. aren't actually real. Um, and, and it's that sort of realisation is, you know, you, you've... You've been part of the problem. Well, it goes two um, ways, I think, Andrew, because because it can it could have persuaded you to hate me and to and to send me vile messages every day and to see me as some sort of enemy or to call me a traitor. So so that that really interests me because I, I'm delighted that you discovered the show and my work and that it somehow worked as an antidote to the hatred you were being spoon fed before. But what 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 what's the difference? Do you think between you? And the people that listen to me and read their Facebook feeds and decide that I'm the problem, bless them. I, I think you're seeing more of the bigger picture. So if you're on Facebook, you've got the algorithms that, that yeah. give you what they think you want to see. If it ties in, so everything on your phone or your tablet is all linked with the, the, the cookies and what have you. I'm not very technical. No, um, you and me both. But, but whatever I've sort of seen on on. The, the mail online probably ties into my feed on Facebook, so I was getting 50% okay. of the facts, but they were all the facts that backed up my opinion. Yeah. And I think once I moved away from that and you start seeing the full prism um, of, of information that's out there, you, you make a more informed opinion. It's like being blind arguing about the colours of a rainbow if you're on Facebook, but once I, I, you get away from it... And, and, and why then you must also have been less welded to that worldview than others are? I, and so... 
why do you think that was? Why do you think it was a, it was a, it was a, an addiction you could beat, whereas other people, I mean, would furiously deny that they were addicted to anything. All the all the stuff that they swallowed was poisonous and untrue. But but you must have, it must have been a smaller part of your identity than it is for for some of the really lost causes. I think, from my perspective, I always like to sort of take pride in the fact that I base my opinion and um, base my ideas on facts and not opinions. Yeah. Um, but if the only facts that you're getting yeah. back up a sort of opinion that you've got, you're not going to change your view. So I fight with family members over Brexit. Uh, okay. um, fight out with my father-in-law, oh, um, a couple of work colleagues. Um, but I, you know, I work with a gentleman who, who lived in Germany for years. Is is partners from Hungary. And it's only from talking through different bits and pieces that you realise, you know, we voted to leave, mm. um, but we've still got the same sort of deal that we had before. We've just got no influence <laughs> over it at all anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, that's heresy yeah, that, still. That, I don't think people are ready to accept that yet, Andrew, although it is, yeah, that's why I mean, bang on the money. I, I, I'm, really proud, I'm really proud of my part I played in that one, but yeah. it's, it, it's, it's just crazy, but it's, it's like being on on the roundabout and it's spinning and spinning and spinning. So all the facts you don't want are, the, are all a blur around you. Uh, but the facts that really apply to what you want them to be uh, are very clear. And it's only once you sort of stop and take stock and actually question and challenge a few things. Of but your I, I, that, yeah, I think, I think we might have danced around something here. I, and I, I could be wrong, but I don't know that you would ever have been... A, you never believed that your skin colour made you better than somebody else, did you? Or did I, I'd you? I'd like to think not. Well, no, 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 be honest. I've, I've, never, I've never been party to that. But I and that might be the why. difference. So that, that, that might be the difference. Because when I, when I, cause lots and lots of people who listen to me every day um, hate my guts and, and routinely call for me to be exposed to all manner of privations and unpleasantness. But, and, and despite the fact that I'm white, but, but the, I'm trying to work out what the difference is between you and them. Because, you know, they get spoon-fed the same poison that you were swallowing and, and often seem as if they'll never see the light. But that, that must be the white, that, that original lie that the colour of your skin makes you more valuable than that person over there with darker skin. If you've never, if you've never swallowed that lie, then everything you've said to me in the last few minutes makes sense. Because I can see how an unleavened diet of anti-EU rhetoric would lead you to vote Brexit. But you didn't vote Brexit because you hate Muslims. I've taken calls from people yeah. who voted Brexit because there's too many Muslims in the country or too many brown faces on the tills in Tesco. You never went down that road. You never opened your heart to that racist lie, which is why you've been able to wean yourself off all the other ones. No, that's, that's, that's a fair point. Is I it? mean, for me, the whole Brexit build-up started back in the 90s in my formative years. Yeah. Uh, so I was born in 81. Um, so the first real exposure I had to politics was, you know, we're going to scrap the pound yes. and adopt the euro. Um, you know, Tony Blair obviously wanted to be the, the, the president of the EU, which is why he was moving the country closer to the European Union. So we right. had a future in politics um, and all that sort of rhetoric, obviously fishing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but I, I was sort of not not indoctrinated on no, that. I get it. Everything I read, everyone I saw it was in my circle that I spoke to, you know, these unelected bureaucrats dictating, you know, the, yes. the shape of our bananas. Yes. Um, y y y oh, this, all, do you know, this is a, fascinating for me because it, it's so easy to go too far in the opposite direction sometimes and to, to, to paint everybody of a certain view as being possessed of certain attributes. But but you, 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 you were like a thoughtful Brexiter, but you, you'd never turn the menu over. You only ever saw the dishes that were available on one side of the menu. And when you turned the menu over, suddenly you had a different meal every day just a, a couple of months too late i think is probably wow. the, the irony of hey, that one but yeah i hear you but there you go at least i mean better late than never <laughs> no that's it but it's everybody fighting for you know freedom of speech but what i don't think people are getting is they're fighting for the freedom for people to manipulate their freedom of speech via media and social media yeah and, and other people and are, the are and, that we need to look at and the people leading the campaigns are, 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 are fighting for the right to be free to make hate speech unchallenged and, and without consequences. Andrew, what a lovely call. Um, I, I, one of the things I felt most keenly about the lockdown was missing the hay on my literary festival. So uh, when it is back and running, back up and running, and if they're foolish enough to book me again, I'd love to buy you a pint. Take care um, and, and have a good afternoon. Say.
Yes. Uh, 